Quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, here is how I see us proceeding tonight. We will begin with the annual State of the Town Address, followed by the financial update by the Finance Committee. After that, I assume we will proceed directly to Article 17, the budget. Traditionally, we have completed action on the budget during one session, so it is planned that a vote will be taken on it, taken up to take it out of order to make sure we get to it early enough. When we handle the budget, as we've done in the past, we'll take it by groupings. On page 49, I think is the uh, place in your warrant, well, the four groupings will be line items B99 through F99, and then G91 through M92. The third grouping is the schools, U99. And the fourth is W99 through Y99. We'll go through that again when we get to it. If you have any discussion of proposed amendments, the time to do so is while we are in the midst of that particular grouping. We'll vote on any proposed amendments before moving to the next set of line items. We won't vote on the budget itself until we have finished all four sections. Next, I expect we'll go back to the articles we skipped on Monday, effectively going in order, beginning with 10, 13, 15, and then finishing with 18. And now, business under Article 2, Mr. Berman moves that we take Article 2 from the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Mr. Berman, the state of the town. Good evening, and thank you to Town Manager Bob Lasher, Superintendent Dr. John Flair, uh, John, John Doherty, members of the Reading School Committee, um, town and school staff, town meeting members, my colleagues on the, on the board, neighbors in the hall, and those watching at home in RCTV, and um, in homage to bring your family to work day, my wife and my son um, in the front row. It's my honor to deliver the first ever State of the Town Address as Chair of the Reading Select Board. Before I summarize the events of the past year and outline the challenges and opportunities for this coming year, I want to recognize some new and returning faces to our town government family. Um, congratulations, if, and if you're here, um, I know many of you are town meeting members, if you're here, just either stand up or raise your hand. Um, but congratulations to Andrew Grimes and Alice Collins, who return as library trustees. Um, congratulations also to Dave Hennessy and John Stempeck, uh, who will continue to serve on the Light Board, and Elaine Webb, who returns uh, to the School Committee. And how can we forget you, Mr. Moderator? Um, there's a whole entire generation in Reading who have never known anyone else but Alan Folds as the town meeting moderator. Um, we're also blessed to welcome the energy and talents of those elected for the first time. Manette Verrier will join the Library Trustees, and Sherry Vandenacker, who was appointed in the middle of uh, this past budget session to replace Dr. Gary Nyan, was elected in her own right and will take her seat on the school committee. I also want to welcome a new colleague to my board, Vanessa Alvarado. Vanessa can't be here tonight. She had a long-standing um, family commitment, so now I get to actually do this without her here, which is a lot more fun. <laughs> um, besides bringing down significantly the average age of this board, uh, Vanessa brings a unique perspective to the select board. She has a keen intellect and a firm understanding of the budget from her years of service on FinCom, and she represents a segment of volunteers in this town um, who basically um, do school drop-off, hop on the train, go to work, come home, make dinner, and then go to the meeting. That's a valuable uh, perspective to have. But more importantly, she listens, she asks questions, and she's open-minded. It's a valuable skill set, and I'm confident she'll make us better. I'm delighted to be a, a colleague of hers, and I want to welcome Vanessa Alvarado. So thank you. And finally, I want to welcome the new members of this body, town meeting. Whether you were here the old-fashioned way by walking around and getting 10 people to sign a, peti you know, a petition, or you got on stickers or a writing campaign, um, you, um, we're thrilled that you're here, and I, I hope you know what you signed up for. So I know you guys got sworn in last time, but for those new town meeting members, please stand up and be recognized by the body.
don't hate me on the way out. Uh, and to all the women and men who've agreed to serve, I say a heartfelt thank you from a grateful town. Your neighbors have entrusted you to act in good faith and to work diligently for the best interests of the town. I'm confident you'll do just that. And while we welcome new and returning colleagues, I think it's very important that we also acknowledge and thank an old friend. Let me take a moment to say a special thank you to John Arena, who graced this board for two terms. I serve with John both on the Selectmen and on the Finance Committee. He has served this town with distinction for many years in a myriad of volunteer services, not just in town government, as a coach, um, church volunteer, a variety of different um, opportunities. He has a first-rate intellect and his ability to synthesize complex data into understandable nuggets was an incredibly valuable attribute to have on this board. We all owe John a, a debt of gratitude. No one should doubt his commitment or his love for the town of Reading. I don't see him here tonight, but I think we should send him some congratulations. Thank you, John. <laughs> Friends, I started thinking of, about giving this address three weeks ago. If I had to write it then and describe then the state of the town in one word, I would say we were fatigued. This has been a grueling and long 12 to 18 months. Both overrides and the corresponding budget cycles were exhausting endeavors that dominated the, poli the body politic really since the summer of 2016. It's been almost two full years. Um, but there's other things. We endured a major fire, which left dozens of our neighbors homeless. Um, we endured two bomb threats and a natural uh, gas failure, which left dozens with no heat on the coldest nights of the year. We have to say a special thanks to our DPW and our law enforcement um, and our um, public safety folks for really enduring that. So please, thank you. And the recent proliferation of racist and anti-Semitic graffiti has challenged us to engage in community-wide discussions as we ponder proper responses and question what it means to be an open and welcoming community. These are all some of the things that we had to deal with. But after some much-needed rest, contemplation, I stand before you tonight re-energized and never more confident in our ability to ensure not only our fiscal stability, but our civic pride as a town that's the envy of all who observe. Some may think that the passage of the override was the only significant issue we undertook this year. It certainly seemed like it, especially over the last four months. But we were busy elsewhere. We implemented the first year of senior tax relief. 182 households received, on average, a 30 percent reduction to their property tax bill. This was paid for by other homeowners and owners of commercial property. We didn't forego the revenue, we just passed it on to our neighbors. We expect participation to increase next year as the word gets out. We remain committed to do all we can to allow those seniors who help build this town age in place if they so choose. We completed our housing production plan. We'll continue to strive to reach our legal and moral obligation of 10% affordability of our housing stock. No less than five large projects have moved through the permitting stage through CPTC and ZBA and are ready to put shovels in the ground this year. In fact, one already has. Our efforts have been rewarded by the state as we've been given a safe harbor from, 40B, from future 40B developments until February of 2019. Only a handful of other towns in the Commonwealth have been granted such a waiver. This allows us to control the scope, design, implementation, um, and uh, of high-density housing and increase our leverage over developers who want to build here. It's an important document. In October, we hosted an economic development summit at the library with Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Jay Ash, as the featured speaker. There we introduced Reading to the development community and let the world know, in no uncertain terms, that Reading was open for business. Over 75 people in attended, including a number of developers, as we showcased the town as a worthy place to invest. We completed our emergency management training and building security study. As you know from recent events, we can never prepare a train enough. Building security will be an ongoing topic going forward. The schools will be hosting a community-wide school safety forum on May 23rd, and building security will be a major part of our capital budget going forward. We've completed a good chunk of revamping the selectmen's operating policies. 
This is important as the public has a right to expect from its highest elected board predictable and transparent operations, especially in the wake of what some have called a trust gap. So let's talk about the override for a second. What will it do? What won't it do? And, what, and more importantly, what did we learn? You, the, the, Red, the voters of Reading, underwent an intense number of months of digesting data, attending community meetings, reading and writing millions of social media posts, letters to the editor, speaking, cajoling, persuading, yelling, arguing with your neighbors. Um, and we undertook individual and collective soul searching about what's the kind of town that we want to live in. We came out in record numbers for a municipal election, 43% and overwhelmingly decided to invest in our town and our schools and ourselves. While relieved, we must be mindful and respectful of our neighbors who did not vote in favor. Living among us are folks who struggle with this extra burden. We need to make sure that we help those who need it most. We're all now familiar with what the passage of the override will help us achieve. Um, if, you, if you don't remember, I'm sure many of you got in your door, maybe one or three or five times, these flyers that tell you exactly what the override's going to do. Um, but we're also this evening in the budget presentations, we're going to hear more in great detail. Now that our fiscal health and ability to deliver basic services is assured for the next few years, um, the town and the schools can focus on a more robust agenda for the future. The tenor of this meeting and this address would be so much different without your efforts, and I thank you. While we've all breathed a, a collective sigh of relief, the passage of the override is not a panacea. The town is not all of a sudden flush with cash. As you recall, the town manager and the superintendent together proposed level service budgets that required about $5 million of additions. These did not include nice to haves, or wouldn't it be nice if we had. Um, it included only what in their minds, uh, what was needed to get us to level service. At a marathon meeting on January 30th, we settled on $4.15 million as the figure that accomplished the most with the best chance of passing. The need for future operating overrides is still here. Nothing about the results on April 3rd makes the annual challenges and structural deficits inherent in Proposition 2 and a half disappear. When revenue is capped and costs are not, at some point, the reset button needs to be hit if you want to avoid drastic cuts. That is not changed. Our budgets will always be stressed. It's important that we set these expectations. There are many lessons learned from this endeavor that I believe will have a lasting impact on how government operates in Reading, not only on future override ballot initiatives, but on all key decisions facing the town in the future. Here are three. One, don't assume, ask. During override one, we perhaps made decisions in a bubble. After hearing loud and clear that we did it wrong, we went back and asked, so what did we do wrong? The Selectman survey was a critical component in getting us to yes in, in April. There, 2,200 respondents laid out the blueprint for success. In it, you told us what we needed to do to turn the necessary number of no voters into yes voters. You said, make it smaller. Show us where the money's going. Show us where you cut, and tell us about the other revenue. You told us, and we listened. We also endured some pointed and perhaps deserved feedback in the comments section. Hundreds of pages and probably over a thousand comments. You did not hold back. Stinging? Um, probably. Necessary? Absolutely. We needed to hear what you said. Number two, an engaged community is a better community. It's not surprising to me that 43% of the electorate turned out for this vote. People have never stopped caring about the town they live in. But most times, they were satisfied to relegate the decision-making to others. But when a neighbor knocks on your door, or invites you to a coffee, or engages you at the soccer field, or calls you at home, you'll listen more. We, as the elected officials, have a limited reach. You, the citizens, are, more, are far more adept at telling the story, making the case, and reaching your neighbors. You are clearly invested. Number three, don't make assumptions about your neighbors. Perhaps during override one, assumptions may have been made by the voters and basically by us too. Only the elderly vote. Or only folks with kids, uh, with school-aged children care about the schools. If you voted no, you were selfish. 
If you voted yes, you just are newcomers that want to chase us old timers out. There's more. I've heard them all. So did you. But the biggest takeaway for me as an elected official is that I firmly believe that when you lay bare all the facts on the table for everyone to see, uncover all the numbers, tell the whole story, even if you know it's something that people don't want to hear or it's something that's going to make them angry, people will make the right decisions. It's not for us up here to tell you what type of town government you should have or that you deserve. Waiting 15 years to pass an override because we were fearful of the outcome has had devastated and long-lasting consequences. We've all heard the term trust gap. Maybe part of the gap is that we didn't trust you enough to make the right decisions. Hopefully, in this campaign, we've learned fundamentally to change the way town government interacts with you and the way you interact with town government. So what now? Um, there are a slew of issues coming before us in the next month which will require action and attention. Among these are meeting with the Housing Authority to discuss preserving the affordable housing that we already have. We're going to work with the Board of Health on a pesticides policy. We're going to review and adopt townwide personnel policies, discuss a public process for Oakland, the Oakland Road property, continue contract negotiations with Comcast and Verizon who provide our cable TV. We're going to establish a new master plan. Um, and town manager goals for the next year, as well as finalizing plans for the water tower. But I want to focus on a couple of major issues which are probably going to take up most of, our, um, uh, most of our attention. One is economic development and new growth. Expansion of the 40R Smart District to include much of the downtown has, has and will continue to have a profound impact on the face of downtown and the health of our downtown business community. I want to pay a special <clears throat> thank you to Assistant Manager Jean, Del Jean Delios, her staff, and the volunteer boards for years of planning and now overseeing five major projects that will break ground in the downtown in the next 12 to 18 months. There's the Post Postmark Square 40R, Gould Street 40R, the Sunoco 40R, in addition to the 40B at Lincoln Street, which is already broken ground, and the 40B reuse at St. Agnes. Collectively, this is over $100 million of private investment that will create over 200 new households, all within walking distance of the downtown commuter rail. That's 200 new customers for Nick's Dry Cleaners, 200 new birthday cards for the Hitching Post, 200 bottles of wine for Pomplamoose, watch Chief, um, and Professor's Market will do a booming takeout business. Also, new wayfinding signs, which culminated from a grant uh, community Development Director Julie Mercier uh, wrote, will help create a sense of place and arrival and make the businesses at Maine and Haven a destination rather than something you zoom past on your way to Stoneham or North Reading. All the 40R projects will also include commercial and retail space, including restaurants and outdoor seating, giving life during the day to downtown when most of us leave town to go to work. The Sunoco project will also add three parking spaces. So I want to take a second and kind of you can give you a, a new a tour. You don't have to leave your seats of what you will come to see. This is the new post office. Well, it's the old post office, but it's the new development, Postmark Square. In it, you can see that, we, that they're going to keep the facade. And what you see is Haven and, and Sanborn, where there's going to be new commercial space. And 50 units of ownership housing will be stepped out from the side with underground parking. Um, it'll be a project that um, when you walk by it, you won't be able to see the massive density, um, but there'll be 50 uni new units of home ownership there. This is the new Gould Street project, or what was EMARC. I think 60 units, 55, 55 units of, of rental housing, all, and com new commercial space um, along Gould Street um, a a as you kind of go from Haven in into Gould. Also parking underground. This is 467 Main Street or the Sunoco station. What's great about this project is that it brings the building up to the street level. Right now, that's where the Sunoco is. It is just one large curb cut with just vacant space in front. It will bring commercial space up front and housing behind it. That's the corner of Main and Green. Um, we're also going to create outdoor seating and potentially some restaurants. If you kind of go this way, um, what, you're gonna see, what comes there is Professor's Market um, and Dan Dewar's um, convenience store. 
uh, and, the, and the spot on the left is going to be three new uh, par uh, d parking spaces. So it's going to basically bring the walkability of downtown further away. This is Lincoln Street, uh, 40B, our favorite project. You all know about that. I don't need to go into much more detail. But look where it is, right by the railroad tracks. And then this is Schoolhouse Commons, or the St. Agnes reuse. It's really technically not downtown, but there'll be 20 units of housing there um, with parking, a really kind of a, a very, very short walk to downtown. So while it's not technically in the downtown, I sort of include that in our, in our reuse. I talked earlier about the wayfinding signs. So right now, Reading, downtown Reading is like Oakland. There's no there there. You don't know you're there until you pass it. Well, um, thanks to Julie's hard work, we got a very, very rare grant to work with a designer and an, ar an architect on just sort of branding what our downtown is going to be. And this is sort of this and some of the other signs will direct people to parking, will let people know that they've arrived at this destination. It's really going to make Maine and Haven really the focus of our downtown. Notice that the colors are not red and black. Notice that it's not a rocket, right? What we did was we wanted to sort of brand the town for what it is, for its historical purpose. The buildings on there represent the iconic buildings of Reading. Parker Tavern, Old South, the library, Town Hall, and those treatments are, are treated there with some pleasing colors that reminisce about the fall. Um, totally different and totally new. So this growth, while it's exciting um, and it does provide opportunities, will not come without its challenges. Um, the impacts of construction, as well as the presence of high density housing spilling into residential neighborhoods, need to be carefully managed. The select board is committing to making these new neighbors good neighbors. Similarly, we're committed to ensuring the 40B at Lakewood and Eaton is properly sized and that the neighbor's concerns and input are heard before the project is approved. We're also going to, I know everybody's thinking, where's the parking? We're going to engage in a downtown parking study, taking into account all these new housing units, and yes, it will include the depot and probably rethink that sticker. This new growth is imperative if we're going to increase the percentage of our commercial tax base, which is currently the lowest amongst our peer communities. We are dead last in what we raise in commercial tax revenue. It's also going to give the override some legs. Currently, we budget about $550,000 of new growth annually, annually. That new growth is basically you add a deck to your house, you tear down one small house and build another. It's the new assessed value. It's about $550,000 a year. Just with the known pipeline projects that we have, our new growth figure will approach a million dollars over the next few years. This will hopefully sustain the override you so generously voted. Not all of this growth is going to be net growth. There will be some added costs to service the new residents, um, but it is very po net positive relative to what it could have been if we did single, housing single fam family housing. The lion's share of the new housing that's going to be created is one and two bedrooms. Um, and it's really going to be designed for millennials who are going to take the train into Boston. We're in the process of hiring our new economic development director to replace Andrew Corona, who left when his wife was transferred to a new job. Andrew left us in a very good place. Reading is now on the radar of the of for the development community. His re replacement will have as task one coordinating all the moving pieces of a potential DPW garage project. The last topic I want to touch on on this address is not the what, but the how, and really defines the essence of how we should operate a modern day local government. Broadly speaking, I call this volunteerism, collaboration, and civic discourse. In my travels, I'm often approached by citizens who say, the town should do more of this, or the town should do less of that. What's the town? Who's the town? If you look up at this podium, there's maybe 15, 20 odd people sitting here, and only two draw a salary from the taxpayers. The town is you, and the town is me. Reading has always enjoyed a robust volunteer spirit. There are over 40 volunteer boards or commissions, consisting of over 150 volunteers appointed just by our board. There are countless other volunteer organizations working for the benefit of the town, from Friends of the Reading Library to Friends of Reading Recreation, who we gave a special award to last month to folks who work with the Senior Center delivering meals to folks who do their taxes, who go shopping for them. 
There's even a new organization called Arts Reading, which is dedicated to creating a cultural district in the downtown. All of these are exciting and important and valuable uh, um, volunteer efforts. One of the benefits of the override campaign that, that, that I saw is that it uncovered a new generation of leaders, many of whom got involved in, t in the town for the first time. The mom I canvassed with is also an investment banker. The retiree holding a sign was a, a retired exec from an engineering firm. The point is, is that, there are, that are, there are really talented and invested people living in town who've never been asked. And we're going to need all of you. You, didn't, you don't need an advanced degree, just a commitment and a love of service. I'm asking you to consider putting your skills and your commitment to work as we look to fill the myriad of positions on town boards and also look to the, also the outside organizations that are always looking for volunteers. The issues we face in town are complicated and many of our resources are limited. Driving to Boston Saturday night for dinner, I counted no less than 15 construction cranes from the Zakem Bridge to the seaport. Business is booming in Boston as we enter the eighth year of an economic recovery, but our partners in the federal and state government have not shared the largesse. Reading's share of the governor's local aid budget increased by a scant 1.8 percent. While I would welcome with open arms Betsy DeVos or Charlie Baker coming through the back door to join us tonight, I would like it a whole lot better if they brought a check. Not likely. For better or for worse, folks, we're on our own. It means we have to do things differently now. Boards and committees used to working in silos are going to have to come together. And i give you a couple of examples. We all know the Senior Center and the Killam School need either massive renovations or to be totally rebuilt. We'll be challenged to do both of them. But is a possible solution one multi-generational facility that serves both populations? If so, the select board and the school committee will need to work together like they never have before. Imagine a campaign where the seniors and the parents of school-age children work hand-in-hand -hand on the same project. We're all grateful to the RMLD, not only for the reliable, low-cost energy delivered in a customer-friendly way, but also for the $2.5 million dividend it pay, pays to the town each year. But we heard Monday night from my colleague Dan Ensminger and RMLD Chair Phil Pacino that in the age of conservation, RMLD is selling less power. Their fixed costs, meanwhile, are, are increasing. How, for example, can the select board and the RMLD work together to assist RMLD develop other sources of revenue? thus not only protecting our dividend, but enhancing our economic development efforts as a town with the lowest electric rates in the region. How can the library leverage that beautiful new building um, and work with all the other different boards and committees and, in town to really get people to come there and to do things that maybe haven't been done before? I think you get my point. To thrive, we're going to have to do business differently. We must pay more than lip service to the notion of working together. We're going to have to think out of the box. The select board has no monopoly on how to get this done, trust me. The ideas window is now open. We'll work with each and all of you to come up with innovative and creative ways to move ahead. I know there's tremendous talent and commitment within the 01867. Please come forward and apply for one of those many open positions that we're gonna advertise shortly or join one of the other dozens of civic groups working in town. If you don't know exactly what you want to apply for, just send a resume, we'll find a place for you. Some people have suggested that maybe our local civic discourse has deteriorated over the last couple of election cycles, and that maybe we've devolved into factions. I don't know, maybe that's true, but I don't think that's who we are. I believe all of us have the best interest of the town of Reading in our hearts and our minds. Maybe we don't trust our neighbors have that, but I know we all do. The override showed us that people who don't always agree will work together on a project that is in the best interest of the town of Reading. If we get people working together, trust will slowly build and we'll be better for it. And to quote President Kennedy, he said, civility is not a weakness. In the meantime, put down your devices, talk to your neighbors face to face. You'll find that you actually have a lot in common. Thank you all very much for your love and commitment to the town of Reading. I am tremendously proud and excited about what lays ahead for us. So let's stop talking and get to work. Thank you. Mr. Lidecker. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, those of you know, that know me know I like to be brief, so I will. 
Um, first, I want to thank the members of Yes for Reading, and especially Aaron Gaffin and Michelle Sanfi for their hard work in getting out the vote in the recent override. I also want to thank the employee. I also want to thank the employees of the town and the elected boards for all their work in a long and uh, sometimes grueling budget season. As a result of your efforts, the voters of Reading showed their support for the needs of the town when they voted on April 3rd. Um, I personally have a tax background, and I think it's pretty safe to say that no one really wants to pay higher taxes. However, most will admit that local spending is where you see the greatest personal impact from your tax dollars. Local tax dollars are visible to all in the areas of public safety, schools, infrastructure, and services provided to residents. One could argue that real estate taxes are unfair or regressive, but it's still the primary way the town of Reading has to raise funds needed to provide those services. Property values in Reading and throughout the state have risen, often making it difficult for people that have owned their homes for many years to afford the property tax levied on the value of their home. Last year, Reading attempted to decrease the impact on many of our senior citizens in town by reducing their property tax levy if they met the requirements. Though not a perfect solution, it, was, it helped to lessen the tax burden on many of the long-term residents of the town. I've served on the Finance Committee for the past five budget seasons, and I've seen firsthand that because of the unfunded mandates of state and federal levels, a significant portion of the increases in spending are outside of the town's control. With increases in health care costs, the need to fund pensions and other retirement benefits accrued by the town employees over their many years of service, coupled with a reduction in state aid, the limits of the town's property tax increases within the confines of Proposition 2 and a half constrain the, uh, the town's ability to provide the services that are expected by the residents. A partial solution might be, to, might be found at the state level through many through more state aid, but Massachusetts has its own issues, probably only solvable with an increase in the state income tax rate and a better and more reliable system of sharing with the local cities and towns. For the foreseeable future, the town can only look to the property tax to fund the majority of its expenses. The voters' recent approval of an override of more than $4 million will allow the schools to restore teachers and programs that have or would have been cut, as well as increased staffing in public safety, the library, and other town services where cuts would have otherwise been required. There will be issues with the budget going forward, and the town's capital budget has several large items that will be needed in the near future. Everyone hopes that the recent override, coupled with new growth, will enable the town to provide the funds to support the necessary town services for several years before another override will be needed. For now, at least, we can continue to fund the services that, and the needs of the residents. Mr. Berman moves that we lay Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Mr. Ensminger moves that we take Article 17 from the table. Second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. The uh, Article 17 is before the body. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. If I might have more than the five or ten minutes that's typically donated. Uh, this evening we're going to progress in effectively four budget sections with an overview at the beginning. Um, first I'll describe shared costs. Then I'll describe the town government departments. Superintendent Doherty will come up and discuss the school department. And I'll close it off with the enterprise fund budgets. As part of the overview, um, one of the important things for you is the town meeting always needs to know is what's the wallet look like. Our free cash is just a little bit above the FinCom minimum policy of 7%. It's at 9%, which is good. Um, most of our neighbors are in the 8 to 10 cent, 10 percent range, which always surprised me um, that uh, some of the peer communities that you don't think of as being particularly wealthy have uh, good levels of free cash. You can see our, our best years were behind us. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the override will impact the future of free cash, but we still have adequate amounts. We're not swimming in it, but we have adequate amounts, and I, I don't expect that to get worse. 
Regeneration of free cash or reserves happens in two ways generally. Uh, one is we get more revenue than we expect, which is not a very typical thing, certainly out of the state. Um, and secondly is that we spend less than is budgeted, and that is more typical. Um, the, the schools uh, on a school year and the town on a uh, calendar year, if you will, are quite different. When we have a vacancy, we don't have an urgent need to get a person into a classroom, for instance. So when we have vacancies, we tend to not spend the money that was budgeted and turn it back. Um, the, com the combination of uh, receiving more revenues and spending less than was budgeted is called regeneration. We've had some very strong years a few years ago of almost, I think it was $3 million. One million is an assumption um, that we make now for every year. Going forward for our presentation tonight, both the superintendent and I will talk about primarily the override budget, but I do want to call to your attention um, the booklet in front of you, with, with, except for one page, is a balanced budget, not an override budget. So we're going to spend some time describing to you the differences of what you see. On page 49 is the most accurate uh, summary of what we're about to talk about tonight. Um, if you look at this middle column, says change. Um, you can see 3% as a subtotal and a total is a very typical revenue number for the town. To the far right, um, with the override, FY19-0 is override, we have a 7.5% increase in revenue. That just gives you a picture of what the difference is. This will be a little challenging to read, but it's a summary of what's on pages 48 and 49. Again, that middle column that says change, we were showing a total spend increase of 3.7% in the general fund and 3.7% total. Uh, that will increase now to over 8% in the general fund and just under 8% total. Um, there is some small differences in the enterprise funds I'll get to uh, later, which are not in your booklet. But again, this gives you the impact, and here's the four sections. Uh, first, I'll do shared costs, which are up a little over 9%. Town government just over 7%, schools about 8.5%. All that combination is the general fund. And then I'll finish off with the enterprise funds that are about 4%. So again, if you have any questions or comments or amendments during the shared portion, that's a good time to do it. I'll then move on uh, with the moderator's permission to town government and so forth. The, um, the way we'll describe it, in, uh, in my presentation, you'll see red letters showing an override figure that's different from what's in your booklet. The two figures on shared costs that were increased by the override were benefits and capital, and this was a conscious decision that we all made uh, in conjunction with the elected boards and the finance committee. If we had not done this, then to come up with the 5% necessary capital next year meant we'd have to cut things. If we suddenly realized, oh, we forgot to fund health insurance and pensions and so on and so forth for benefits with new employees, we'd have to come up with that funding. So we, we parked money, if you will, in both these two spots. Uh, and you'll get, I'll get into detail shortly. But it was done consciously and for a reason, so that we would not have to go scrambling to find money in the future years. Again, that's a 9% 9 9 increase driven by the change in the override in benefits and capital. Specifically for now, we put all the override money, um, over $600,000 worth of it, into the health insurance line. I am quite certain that the town accountant will need to move some of that around during the year. Uh, next year, town meeting just votes the total line, so she has the authority to do that. I can tell you that Medicare will undoubtedly need a boost, and workers' comp will probably need a boost. But for now, we're putting health insurance uh, there. I also want to follow up on some comments that have been made for a few months and just make sure everyone's clear. Health insurance going forward is a national problem and it's a Reading problem. Health insurance historically is not a problem in Reading. For the last 10 years, we have on average increased our health insurance spending by 3%. That's in line with our revenues. So I take my hats off to the employees, to the unions, um, they've worked very collaboratively. We have a 71-29 split. We're very good partners on this. We have avoided premium costs by shifting costs to out-of-pocket expenses for those who use it. 
Um, I virtually don't think, I, I don't know anyone in the private sector that I know that have only had a 3% increase for 10 years. So we're very fortunate, but one of the reasons we needed an override is we don't have a lot more tricks in that bag to pull out. And with health insurance being a problem nationally, it was going to be a challenge. For capital, as I mentioned in passing Monday night, the additional 200 odd thousand from the override were placed in with the permanent building committee. Um, I described some of the reasons for that. Um, the order of what is behind me is in the order of that it shows up in the capital plan, so it's not that I can't figure out high to low. Um, the capital plan itself is pages 203 to 211 towards the end of the book. It's a very detailed map laying out for the next 10 years how we're going to spend money. Um, this year, uh, on purpose, we pulled out some of the larger capital projects because we don't really know how we're going to fund them. As a result, there's quite a bit of funding in the capital plan available. It can't do all those projects, but it can certainly take a bite out of many of them. That'll be a pretty big discussion. Um, the Finance Committee and S School Committee and Selectmen especially uh, we'll probably come up with a different capital plan for next November that may or may not be able to incorporate some of these items. Um, but again, for now, as a, as a holding place, the Permanent Building Committee will have more funding and we'll see what happens. Uh, debt service is down. The, um, that's a good thing. Debt service will go down even more if you look at the bottom of this slide by 2025, which isn't that far away. Um, $3 million of the $4.5 million of debt will go away. My guess is we'll incur some new debt to replace some of that, whether it's included or excluded. But financially, one of the strongest points of our financial health is we pay very little to debt service. When we want to buy something, just like the old-fashioned, the way I was taught, if you have your money in your wallet, you buy it. If you don't, you wait. So we have really cut back significantly over the last 10 years on how much money we are willing to spend on debt service. There's a good reason for that. Interest paid is a waste of money. <clears throat> Vocational education and FinCom reserves are two small parts of shared costs. Um, actually, Monday morning, interestingly, we got a vocational figure update from one of our three schools, and we're going to be back in November probably asking you for a little more, but that'll depend on the enrollment in the other two schools. Um, this is a very difficult figure for the superintendent and I to wrap our arms, arms around. Um, it seems like the vocational schools just uh, don't have a budget schedule that fits in with town meeting. To just present a number to us Monday uh, with a 7.5% increase at our main voc school really didn't fit in with our budget process too well. And lastly, the FinCom has discussed increasing their $150,000 reserve fund. Uh, but where they can replenish it at two town meetings, including this one, if they need to during the year, it effectively is larger. So that, that concludes my remark on shared costs, if there's any questions, comments, or amendments. Is there a discussion on the um, line items uh, B99 through F99? None appearing. We will move on to the next section. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Again, I apologize that slide's a little small, but I'll now go through the town departments, town government departments. I'll just read them from the top in the order in the budget book. Administrative services, that's a good chunk of town hall. Public services, that's almost the rest of town hall. Uh, finance is upstairs in town hall. Public safety, police, fire, and dispatch. Public works, uh, public library, and then there's two sections of facilities. So you can see from then, again, that sort of slide or that column on the left, uh, both the superintendent and I had budgeted increases of about 2.5%, depending on accommodated costs, that change. But that's what we are looking at next year. 2.5% um, is difficult to balance a budget with. Um, with the generosity of the taxpayers, uh, the town is now looking at a 7% increase, which is certainly the highest I've, I've seen. Um, interestingly, some towns have 5 to 7% increases much more often. I'm not sure how they do it. You can see all the figures uh, except for facilities participated in some way from the override. I'll get into that as I go over each one. Um, facilities is, is sort of a, a basic core function of both the town and the schools. And, um, you know, we, we deal with it as we need to. We, we didn't have any optional things that would be nice to have, I guess you'd say. 
Um, so we had dealt with it in the past. But you'll see all the other departments, something changed with the override. Administrative services, um, the wage run rate was, the natural run rate was 2.6%. We have three elections next year instead of one, so that adds 2.2% to wages for the poll workers. And the override added one position, which is another 5%, which explains the 9.9% 9, 9 .9 increase in wages. So we have a new software training coordinator position. Um, that will help primarily the town, but also the schools with our financial software. Uh, anyone that uses complex financial software, and especially systems, we have about 12 that try to talk to each other. I probably don't need to explain this position to you, um, but the last thing you ever want to do is call a help desk. Now we'll be able to just call one person. Um, there was some small expenses. The run rate was negative. We have some HR training for the organization and some technology equipment. And both the town and the schools um, designed some of the override for one-time things. So that next year and the year after and the year after, we would have those things to cut if we needed to. So we designed in a certain amount of obsolescence, if you will, of some of the items on purpose to see if our other costs rise to push out the sustainability for as long as we could. Public services, we had increased um, some positions, especially in inspections. Uh, you heard from, uh, from Barry Berman how busy the department is in planning and in inspections. So we had already, um, within a balanced budget, increased some of the hours. The override will allow us to increase hours even more, which is very helpful. Um, in addition, we are able to increase some human elder services hours. That is the growing, fastest growing segment of our population. It's a, a moral obligation question as to how responsible town government is or is not for that segment. But I can tell you that one of the biggest benefits of the override is I don't have to worry about not funding that in future years. That would have been a very hard discussion for the community to have. The finance department, as you can see, is very small. There is a, an addition of assistant town accountant position, which almost every community has. Um, what town meeting needs to understand is the town accountant and myself, but particularly the town accountant, have oversight over every single penny that RMLD and the schools spend. Um, the town accountant looks at every single invoice. I spot check her work. Um, it is a very labor intense job. She can't possibly do the job in, in the 37 and a half hours she's paid. Um, the addition of this position is really vital. It'll help the entire organization. Um, the department had a really good year in terms of implementing senior tax relief. They did not need any extra funding or staff. We are keeping our regional assessing arrangement with Wakefield. It's worked out very, very well. And the challenge that this department faced with somewhat smaller funding or staffing is to keep an independence of the accounting, assessing, and finance functions. Um, it's a very strong fiduciary responsibility that those don't overlap, and that's a challenge with us. Um, one of our peer communities, for instance, has six people doing what Reading does with two people. And that way they can segregate the duties. So it's something that the Sharon always has a challenge with, but should be able to manage. Public safety is certainly the biggest beneficiary by far of the override funds. Um, you can see that um, you know, the budget is up now almost 12%. Um, police and fire have almost similar funding and dispatch is almost one-tenth a percent of that. Wages between all three functions were up just over 3%. With the override, they're up over 8%. Um, expenses were almost flat, and they will go up over 8%. And as you'll see, many of those expenses are one time to, to outfit new officers and new firefighters. In police specifically, there is five additional police officers from the override. Uh, that will bring up the staffing to the uh, levels of many, many years ago probably still a little below what it should be, but certainly far better, and something I think that she, the chief and the deputy and myself can very much uh, live with and sleep much better because of. Um, we've made a commitment to the schools that an SRO will be in place in August, so the hiring process in police is typically nine to 18 months. There is no chance we will have five new police officers within the fiscal year, I don't think. There's not enough space in academies. Uh, but there's no reason why the schools should not should wait for an SRO. That's a vital thing. 
um, one of the existing police officers will assume those duties in August and the other five uh, police officers will get in as quickly as we can. Um, unfortunately, uh, training and overtime for training is becoming a much more crucial function in both police and fire. Police, fire, and dispatch work together as well as any of our peers do. Um, we are prepared. We hope we don't ever use it. Again, this is one of those one-time things uh, to outfit five new officers. There's a cost, same with firefighters. That won't be a repeating cost in future years, so hopefully that gives us room to, to deal with future increases. Um, our CASA will be a topic in the next year. Uh, the chief, the superintendent, and I agreed not to make that a topic during the override because it is fully funded by a grant for FY19, and we didn't want to confuse the issue. Uh, but for the year after that is only funded for three months so we will have to come up with a plan and funding and the three of us are also on the board of directors believe me the board of directors of our cast is highly aware of this and is working very hard on it fire and emergency management services is somewhat similar there's one less position added for firefighters there's there's groups in the fire department four groups this will add one firefighter to each group um, to add some depth and also the overtime was increased significantly. We've seen overtime in both departments but especially fire in the last two years especially really climb. Doesn't help when you have fires in June certainly. Um, it's, it's difficult to know where this ends up. We're still at or below levels in our peers so I'm not concerned uh, but overtime is just a very unpredictable number and this will allow us to hopefully fund it more than it needs to be. Um, the, the fire chief demonstrated that the amount of business he has um, in ALS, especially calls, is just soared. You can see with an aging uh, population and with mental health issues in society, that's not going to change. Um, they're very, very busy. I should also mention with fire that um, their ambulance business, uh, if you will, does bring in about $800,000 that is put in the general fund and shared by all of us. Um, dispatch was not impacted by the override. Um, this body a couple of years ago was kind enough to uh, fund a dish, two additional dispatches which allowed overnight staffing to be above one person. If you ever go into dispatch, uh, you'll understand that one dispatcher is not a good idea. Um, there's so much technology involved, there's so much time pressure. Um, it is getting to be a very, very difficult and intense job uh, where a mistake can be life-threatening. So thank you for that, but they were staffed adequately for the foreseeable future. This moves us to public works. There was not a big impact from the override. Um, the run rate of wages was almost 4%. Um, there were a fair amount of promotions and license, uh, licenses earned that deserve those promotions. But the override did, did give us some more clerical help. It gave us actually two positions that are funded half in the uh, general fund and one quarter each in the enterprise funds. Um, in addition, the budget, as it were, as it stood before the override, uh, allowed us to add a highway temp and to increase engineering wages. Um, Marilyn asked a question last week, or last Monday, about uh, pay, and this is where it's most obviously difficult. Um, if you can count those 15 cranes Mr. Berman saw, and every one of them has many engineers behind it. And for Reading to compete in the engineering market is not easy, and we've had a vacancy in engineering now for over a year. Um, I'm hopeful that will be filled shortly. Um, snow and ice funding was increased a small amount. Uh, it was a weird year for snow. It was great up until all of a sudden it was terrible. Um, last year and 2012, I believe, or two years ago and, and 2012 was actually below budget. So this is a tricky area because the money you put aside for snow and ice can never be reduced with a future budget by law. Um, so it's generally a good idea to budget a number that's a little bit below what you think it right, will be on a, a long-term average. And we've done that. Um, you know, it'll be a discussion with FinCom now with override funds whether we increase it. But I would expect in two years out of three to come to this body as we did on Monday night and request more funding because if we budgeted accurately, that means we don't have a police officer, a firefighter, or a teacher in case it snowed, and that seems like a bad idea. The last part of public works are individual line items, obviously not impacted by the override. 
the street lighting budget has gone down significantly uh, you know, over the last several years, uh, partly in thanks to RMLD and their willingness to work with us. Um, this body a few years ago asked uh, or approved a 10-year contract with rubbish and recycling. It couldn't, the timing could not have been any better. We locked in 10 years at 3% as long as the vendor is willing to stand up to that. So far they have. Um, some of the towns around us, for instance, Stoneham, had an existing vendor which just walk away from a contract and the business and prices have soared. And those of you that are familiar with the recycling market, uh, the demand coming specifically out of China and other places has almost vanished. So the secondary market for recycling has caused the prices of that to also rise. So we're very fortunate to lock in a, a good contract with that. Public Library was another beneficiary of the override. They were able to uh, restore and actually increase Sunday hours, and they will add some part-time support staff to be determined um, by the trustees. Some funds also went to the materials budget. The uh, MAR, the Municipal Appropriation Requirement, is 13% of the budget must go to materials. They're now with this new revised budget a little over 14. The trustees would still prefer 15%. It used to be 15% until our population grew. I think when we passed 25,000, oddly enough, the requirement drops from 15% from to 13%. Uh, but the library will, for the first time in, in many years, have good funding, and it's such a beautiful building, it'd be nice to have more hours. And lastly, the facilities department, I mentioned there's two sections. Core is effectively that that is shared between town and schools. There's no impact from the override. You can see it's a very small uh, change. And uh, the town buildings is a much smaller budget, and is, it is only as it says, town custodians and costs directly related with only town buildings. Um, <clears throat> the budget report goes into some detail and answers some questions town meeting had asked a year or two ago about performance contracting. The results have been outstanding. We do have continued debt service for a couple of years. Um, the savings that have flowed to the operating budget have more than paid, well more than paid the debt service. So that was another great decision by the, by the facilities department. And I think that should pretty much wrap up the town budgets. Is the, discuss, is the discussion on this section, uh, line items G91 through M92. Yes, Ms. Doctor. Uh, Nancy Doctor, Nancy Doctor, Precinct 1. Um, regarding the police department, I actually support the increase to the police department, although I have a couple concerns about how the funds are going to be allocated. Um, the chief's report to the Board of Selectmen had reported 215 police calls that were mental health or behavioral health related over the past year. He cited an increase in substance use, suicidal behavioral calls, not just in the general population, but also involving the school population. He talked about an excessive amount of police um, hours spent on addressing social concerns, um, up to eight hours of police time, sometimes on a single call, dealing with these behavioral and psychiatric problems. Um, this is actually in line with a lot of other reports, including uh, the Roberts report that estimates 50 to 90 percent of police officers' time is often spent um, dealing with gathering information, providing social services. So the mention um, of not only that, um, not necessarily being addressed, um, but the mention of an additional school resource officer is a little concerning to me because most studies show that police officers in schools aren't really responding to crime, but they're being asked to deal with mental health issues, family crises, self-injurious behavior, manifestations of childhood dra uh, trauma, and obviously most individuals that cycle through the criminal justice system have serious mental health issues, including substance abuse disorders. Now, uh, my understanding is, is that school resource officers generally do take um, a training course. Um, it's focused on some mental health counseling, but not surprisingly, they're not really trained to deal with really what the severe issues are, not only in the general population, but specifically the issues in our school population. Actually, only professionally trained mental health clinicians with really years of experience and training 
should really be dealing with this. Um, and in fact, um, addressing what are the underlying causes of, say, student misbehavior in the schools. Um, my concern is that when police are brought into schools, they are bringing with them the full force of the criminal justice system, whether the situation warrants it or not. And I do have some concerns with criminalizing youthful dysfunctional behavior. I would like to see our police department, our town follow our neighborhood communities and hire a full-time licensed psychiatric social worker to serve solely on the police force. This will address not only the chief's concern with the amount of man hours spent with police officers, police officers doing social work, but does create a well-documented partnership between the officer and social worker, which has shown to reduce recidivism rates of youth cited for minor crimes, intervenes with youth at risk for police interactions. Most studies show that just the, the presence of a police officer is highly unlikely to detour youths in schools who are determined to get into trouble. In fact, most studies show that elementary school teachers and guidance counselors are much better equipped to identify and refer at-risk students for early behavioral intervention treatment, thereby reducing future problems. The cost of a psychiatric social worker on the police force dramat dramat the dramatically would reduce the time and energy that an untrained police officer is spending on behavioral health calls, freeing them, freeing them up to do their job, which is to police, as well as possibly reducing the need for additional police hours. So I hope that we look at making a fundamental shift in how we're addressing this problem. Thank you. Mr. L Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm obviously going to let the superintendent address a lot of your comments and concerns. Um, but from my perspective and from uh, the district attorney's perspective, our police department and our school department work as well as any two do in the Middlesex County. And I think um, a, a full description of what happened would contradict some of the terms you used. Uh, police for, the police officers are not walking into the school bringing the full force of law enforcement to bear. Um, there's a lot of other resources in the schools and the, and the police partner with them quite well, but I'll let the superintendent address some of your specific concerns. Mr. Darty, do you have any comments? No, when he presents. Oh, when he presents. Okay, fine. Further discussion on this section? Yes, in the back. Hi there, Tom Grant, Precinct 4. Mr. Lasher, thank you very much for the overview, especially how the uh, override uh, funds would be incorporated. Um, this is kind of a bigger picture budget question, but I figure this is as good a place as any. I imagine that um, not all of the additional funding will be able to be spent in this fiscal year, particularly in hiring you know, a number of officers all at once. Given your previous comments about the way free cash flow works, I, I would imagine, and please just correct me if I'm wrong, that the, any additional funds would then flow back into free cash flow. I'm sorry, I said free cash flow, into free cash at the end of the year. Mr. Lelasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I would fully expect that the two chiefs cannot spend all this money within the fiscal year. I'd be very surprised if they could. I'm not challenging you, by the way. <laughs> um, perhaps if there's additional funds available, they can do a little more training than they had planned on, which is a good thing. But I would fully expect those funds, some amount of funds, to go back to free cash or this body not to be requested for more overtime, uh, which is a typical thing you see in the spring. Uh, but the money can't be used by anything other than this department, these, you know, public safety. Thank you very much. And then just as a follow-up, um, I think one of the issues coming or leading into the override was being able to see where the override funds go. So then in future fiscal years, could you maybe just talk about at least conceptually, how you might think about how we might keep track of how those funds are spent going forward. Um, that's a little bit tricky, but you can see, generally speaking, that within town departments, they go up or down a similar amount every year. So if, if for instance, we were to divert funds from police and fire to something else, it would be quite apparent to everyone. Um, since most of our request was for personnel, um, the only way to not continue to spend money on new personnel, assuming we don't fire them, is for us to not replace people that retire. Um, the whole point of the public safety override was for staffing, so that would be an unusual thing to try to do. And in other departments, it's really the same. I think it'll be pretty obvious to this body in future budgets 
if you see a department that's unusually out of line, especially on the low side, that was a recipient of override funds, you should rightly ask a question about that as to why. Um, it's going to be very hard to track the exact $4.15 million, though, because it just flows into the general amount in general. Thank you. Yeah. Further discussion on this section? Senator Pirro, we move on to line item U99, the school department. Mr. Darty. Good evening, town meeting members. Uh, first and foremost, on behalf of the children of the Reading Public Schools, I want to thank the community for their support of the recent override ballot question. As you've seen this evening already, this override will provide much needed town and school services for our community. This budget process, which if we think about it, began almost two years ago with the first override, has been a true team effort. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our town manager, Barbara LaShore, our town accountant, Sharon Angstrom, and all the town department heads for their collaborative efforts during this process. I would also like to thank Director of Finance, Gail Dowd, for her extraordinary efforts during this dual budget process, and our building principals, directors, and other central office administrators for their feedback, input, and support. And finally, I want to thank the Reading School Committee and the uh, Reading Select Board for their leadership during this budget process. Uh, without it, um, we would not be on the path that we are right now. So thank you for that. So this evening, I'm going to present the override budget. Um, first of all, some of these slides are redundant from previous uh, presentations, but it is aligned with our goals, our mission, and our vision of the Reading Public Schools. The budget is a $44 million, $860,275 budget, which does include the override amount of $2 million, $137,250. It does include the retention of 11 FTE staff, which 10 of those FTEs are teachers. It includes the seven middle school teachers, um, the three elementary teachers, and the one elementary tutor. Those were all in the override budget. It also includes the restoration of six FTE staff from previous year's reductions, the five FTE high school teachers, and the uh, one FTE technician. In addition, it includes an additional 13 FTE staff, which these are positions that were in um, either the balance budget or the override budget. There are two curriculum coordinators, uh, which are going to provide much needed curriculum support for our teachers and our administrators, K through 6. There is a .5 team chair, which will allow us to have a full-time team chair at our two largest elementary schools, Killam and Joshua Eaton. There is a .5 FTE assistant director of special education uh, in this, which will now allow us to have a uh, combination uh, team chair slash assistant director uh, to support um, the district-wide special education services. In the uh, balance budget to support some of our um, students on individualized education programs, particularly our students in the RISE preschool, um, there was an additional teacher for a new sub-separate classroom and three additional paraeducators. Uh, we also had three additional paraeducators for other special education programs in the district. Um, we also had one uh, additional kindergarten teacher and two additional kindergarten paraeducators because we did have a uh, significant increase in our kindergarten incoming kindergarten population for next year. And those are partially funded from the kindergarten tuition revolving account. As the town manager mentioned, we also um, strategically uh, put in expenses as part of the override budget for, for future years to create sustainability. Um, and this will provide much needed support in the teaching and learning, learning areas. So there will be uh, next year uh, funding set aside for curriculum updates and renewal, uh, teacher training, classroom computer replacement, and the restoration of the athletic schedule and elementary chorus, which were, in, which were reduced in the balanced budget. Here is the breakdown of the override budget um, by line item detail. And I mentioned all of these uh, earlier. And you can see the um, 
broke it down by wage and expenses, similar to the way the town manager did it. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we did budget um, an amount for expenses as well. So th this, bud this entire budget now focuses on our district priorities for FY19, which are our four focus areas of literacy, closing the achievement gap, mathematics, and social emotional learning. Uh, this is in these are all the four areas that have been in our district improvement plan for the, for the last few years. It keeps class sizes K-2 to two from 18 to 22 students, and actually with the override budget, it allows us to keep our class sizes in grades three through five at the elementary level uh, in the mid-20s. It maintains the middle school interdisciplinary model. Um, it also ensures that our high school juniors and seniors are going to have access to coursework for graduation. The five FTE high school teachers that were in the override budget will provide additional AP courses, reduce class sizes, and additional course sections in many of the key uh, uh, course areas for our students and give them greater access. And it also helps support the Joshua Eaton School Improvement Plan process. When you take a look at the, the uh, expenditures by cost center, um, again, because of the, the override, um, you'll see that there will be some changes um, in the different areas, including um, the five cost centers of administration, regular day, the bulk of the, the funding from the override will be going into the regular day cost center where we had the, the most significant cuts in the balance budget for this year. Um, special education, you can see school facilities and district-wide programs. So it is an 8.4% increase. I should mention there was a line item as part of the override budget for um, salaries for, for retaining and attracting staff, and that has been equitably distributed among the five cost centers because we do have staffing in all five cost centers. So when you take a look at the budget breakdown, when you break down the accommodated and non-accommodated costs, our accommodated costs on the school um, portion of the budget is for special education tuition, um, and, what, and what you see here uh, is that virtually that remained that remained unchanged because the override did not uh, allocate any funds to that area so all of the funds uh, went to non accommodated areas when you break down the cost centers as total of the override budget if for those of you that were part of watching the the balance budget process uh, during January um, what was happening is we were seeing a shift from regular day to special education between the two largest cost centers. The override allowed that shift to uh, reset itself. So now um, our regular day budget is 60%, uh, whereas uh, special education is 31%. And in our three smallest cost centers, uh, administration, school facilities, and district-wide programs are coming in at 3 4 and 2%. The financial drivers for this budget is, includes the salaries and benefits obligations for our represented and non-represented employees. Uh, we are, uh, the school committee is currently in the process of negotiating all five collective bargaining agreements, which ended this year. Um, it also uh, includes expenses in regular day mandatory transportation for students in grades K to six. It includes increases in special education out of district tuition and transportation as a result of an increase in the number of students out of district, but also an increase in the number of students that required specialized transportation. It also restored the following expenses from the FY18 budget, which were reduced, which includes putting the uh, funding back into the building-based budgets, um, district-wide technology repla replacement, and substitute teaching. In addition, the financial drivers include athletic, an increase in athletic expenses, uh, which is contractual coaches' salaries, rental fees for pools, and ice and athletic transportation. We are also seeing an increase in the third year of our uh, contractual cleaning services out of the school facilities budget for at Reading Memorial High School. And also under technology services, we had an increase in renewal of antivirus protection and other software. We did see some decreases in grants and revolving accounts, which uh, contributed to part of the, the reductions that we had to make in the original balanced budget. So we did see a decrease of $200,000 in state circuit breaker reimbursement, 
Um, right now, there is legislation out there to try to increase that percentage back up. So we will see what happens with that, uh, which certainly will help. Um, we also had to reduce the special education tuition offset by $100,000 because we had a decrease of students coming in from other districts. And also, we had to reduce our athletics revolving account um, offset by $50,000 because we had a decrease in user fee revenue. Um, and we do see an increase. We are seeing an increase in students on free and reduced lunch. And that's actually, we're seeing that um, across the board. Items that impact the budget during the school year, and these are things that are unanticipated that are not budgeted for, and this is, this is something that we always keep an eye on every year. Um, certainly staff turnover is something that we need to keep an eye on, um, and, and what happens when you have to hire a teacher that uh, usually in the highly specialized areas that may have, to, may have to come in at a higher salary than the teacher that is leaving. Um, Change in some of our DESE classifications, that's something that we're going to uh, be encountering over the next uh, year. Uh, always uh, looking at special education out of district placement and transportation costs. Um, sometimes when staff are on leave, uh, we have to hire an additional position, which means we are actually carrying two salaries at the same time. And then we are always keeping an eye on changes in state and federal aid and grant funding. And we did see some. Uh, significant decreases in those areas this year and what we're being told in the future is that we will continue to see decreases in federal uh, grant aid that we receive. And then items that were not included in the FY19 budget and this was uh, something that was under the accommodated costs early on in the process was the full funding of the special education out of district tuition and transportation and as I mentioned earlier um, we're going to take a look and monitor those items and certainly if the legislation is, is favorable with the circuit breaker reimbursement that will certainly help and we have applied for extraordinary relief um, for this year and we're waiting to see um, how that how that plays out as well Action. Yes, right here. Oh, just to, um, if I just want to address Mrs. Doctor's question. Oh, I'll, I'll um, come back to you. And Chief, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. The, the school resource officer that, um, any of the school resource officers that, that we've had um, have not focused at all on counseling. That is not their role in our schools. Um, they work very closely with our staff and our administrators, but their role has, has been um, as part of supporting our administration and they are the liaison in the communication between schools and the police department. They do not have a counseling role. We have school-based counselors in all of our schools that fulfill that responsibility. Uh, right here. Good evening, Dr. Darty. Marianne Downing, Precinct 3. Um, I have questions in um, two areas. One of them is probably a quick one. Um, in the summary of the FY19 school department budget, um, the two slides and the override budget, it mentions $50,000 for classroom computer replacement. And I'm just curious, how many that's going to amount to, because I know back, I still have my slide here, on August 28, 2017, when you, did, when you all described the technology work that you had done last summer, last summer you had bought, it said 540 new HP computers last summer. So how many more computers are we getting for the 50,000? And what's our, what's our goal of how many computers to have here in our district? So our our goal is, I'm sorry, our goal is to get the age of our computers down to a five-year replacement cycle. Right now we are at about an eight-year replacement cycle. And so we, um, in discussions I've had with the network manager recently, uh, we have about 400 computers that currently are between five and eight years old. So our goal 
um, with the funding is to get it back to, to get it to the five-year cycle that we want to get it to. We have over 2,200 computers um, in our school district. Well, that was kind of what I was leading to a little bit. Are we trying to shoot for a almost at least beyond a certain grade, a one-to-one -one student to device like some other districts are having kids no. have to get computers? We, we do not have the resources to, I would love to go in that direction, but right now we do not have the resources to do that. Our goal is to get into a consistent replenishment cycle for our aging computers. Once we can do that, we can start talking about other things like one-to-one. -one. Okay, and then just the other question was something you, you touched on where you said, the 360000 to retain and attract staff was equitably um, spent among the, fi um, distributed among the five cost centers. Can you explain equitably? Does that mean evenly or proportionally? Proportionally, not equally, equitably. Equitably would be proportionately with the number of staff you have in each cost center. Because I know when I voted for the override, I, I was assuming most of that 360 k was going to keep regular and special ed teachers. Are we having a problem in all of the cost centers, like, like facilities, retaining and the, attracting staff? The bulk of the funding, because we have teachers, uh, the bulk of our staffing is teachers, will go to teachers. Good. That's what I want. Thank you. Further discussion? Ms. Uh, Ms. O'Neill? Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I was just curious as to, because I don't know anymore, what's the uh, school department's goal in terms of uh, fully funding all day kindergarten? Do you have a, like a plan for that? Or can we work towards that? I think it would be very appealing for the community. We're kind of behind a lot of communities. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I mean, it's certainly, uh, if you look across the Commonwealth, most districts uh, do provide a uh, full day kindergarten without tuition. Uh, we, we aren't in a position to do that in, in this override uh, budget that we passed. So that will be something that the school committee will need to reconvene on uh, as to whether and how we can do that in the future. But right now, it's, it's not uh, in the foreseeable plans. Further discussion? Are we ready to move on? Mr. Lelasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. To move to the fourth and last budget section, uh, we'll deal with the three enterprise funds. Um, right up front, um, if I hadn't gone ahead, um, the, the select board, board of selectmen at the time, voted uh, unchanged water and sewer rates for the first time in quite a, quite a few years, if, if ever. We have um, some ability to control some of the costs the MWA costs, we, we can't control, but we can capital plan around it. So the good news, starting with the rates uh, that will come out in bills in FY19 uh, in November are there's no change in water and sewer, but there is a $20 increase per household um, for the stormwater fee. I'm quite sure we'll get more complaints at Town Hall about that one than a 10% increase in water and sewer, by the way. Um, current reserves are, are very healthy in water and sewer. Um, it would be the equivalent of having something like $40 million of free cash if, uh, if it were similar in the general fund. Those reserves are very helpful for a couple of things. One is for our, an unexpected capital problem. Um, in the operating budget for the town and the schools, unexpected problems are not going to be large generally, maybe a million dollars. In water and sewer, it could be several million dollars if we have some sort of catastrophic failure or problem. Um, so some of those reserves are absolutely needed. Um, the rest can be used um, by the rate setters, the water and sewer commissioners, uh, to manage reserves, to manage rates, rather. And since we can't always tell what the MWRA rates will be, that's a really helpful tool. 
we do have very significant uh, infrastructure needs in both water and sewer, particularly in some in storm water. Um, it would be nice to be able to move more quickly on some of these projects, but the rates that the ratepayer would have to pay are going to be more than the zero to five percent range we'd like to target. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some very minor changes with the override. You'll see that when you're asked to vote on line items. The Water Enterprise Fund and the Sewer Enterprise Fund were each adding a quarter of, of an FTE uh, with, the, with the regular budget. That's a clerical position in DPW that was half general fund, a quarter of each. Now we're able to add a second clerical position in DPW, so water and sewer gain, if you will, another quarter of an FTE at a cost of $10,500. Um, otherwise, the budgets as presented in the, your, your booklet are unchanged. There's really not anything terribly interesting in the water and sewer budgets. The MWRA uh, predictions on the assessment in water is very good. It's, it's about zero. It, it could be negative, but it's about zero. The, um, the use of $550,000 of reserves in water as part of the motion will allow rates to be unchanged. Somewhat of a similar position in sewer. Um, with the difference being that the assessment by the MWA is up about 5%. We won't know a final number until possibly August, July or August. The Sewer Enterprise Fund is much more susceptible to the uh, MWA rates. Much more of the budget is MWA driven. Um, it is very difficult to manage the Sewer Enterprise rates as conservatively as water will be over the next five or ten years because it's just out of our control. Um, but again, for this year, there's no change. Storm water, um, we saw a two or three year increase for sure. We had a good discussion with the board. Um, it was possible to leave rates unchanged for one more year, but then they would have had a spike to $80. This uh, interim change to 60 will probably be able to last for a few years and avoid that larger increase. Um, I'll say that all three enterprise funds are in very good financial shape, but much more importantly, the infrastructure is generally in very good shape. Um, when we, you know, you're bound to have water main leaks, and I learned about one of them from a town meeting member after Monday night, which isn't going to be fixed till tomorrow. It's a small one. Um, but compared to other communities, knock on wood, our infrastructure really is not having a, given us a problem. Um, and, and you as ratepayers have paid for that. You, you've gotten the service you deserve. In other communities, you see catastrophic failures of infrastructure. Um, and then they have to pay then. We tend to do it much more proactively. So you will see budgets for the next several years closer to the 5% area is my guess. Uh, and that's mostly driven by capital projects. Um, in addition, there is um, more population. We're up to 26,500, give or take. We'll be past 27,000 pretty quickly. Um, we have to build the infrastructure for that, and that's one of the reasons the stormwater fund had to go up is because we have some requirements. Our stormwater um, infrastructure or system is a little bit further behind the water and sewer in terms of this growth. But in general, again, no change in rates for water and sewer, fairly dull budgets, uh, stormwater an increase this year, probably another increase in two or three years. Is the discussion on the enterprise funds? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Martyr. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. My favorite subject, Bob. Uh, stormwater management. Uh, they went up just a slightly over $20 this year. I remind, go back to the theory of how do you cook a frog? You put them in cold water and turn the heat up a little bit. Um, and still, my opinion. And I'm sure, and it's nine years, Bob, uh, not ten. Uh, it should be a tax based on a recent court case in the town of Saugus. It should be a tax and not a fee. Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Could you give us a quick update on the situation with wheeling water through Reading to North Reading and, and as part of that update, what if any financial implications that might have? 
It's the last year. The scars are under my shirt that I won't take off. Um, it's been very challenging to understand what North Reading is up to, to try to be as diplomatic as possible. Um, they had a scheduled update to give to our board uh, during the month of April, um, two days before they canceled it. I don't know what they're up to. Right now, we're not planning on them doing joining the MWA and coming through Reading at all. If they want to do that, they're going to have to tell us. Um, we have spent a certain amount of staff time, absolutely. Not a lot of cash out the door. Um, if we came up with expenses and they choose not to join the MWRA, they're willing to repay us. Um, we'll see where that goes. But I can't give you a good update because I don't believe they know. Um, they've had a couple of special town meetings um, uh, up in Andover uh, to reconsider the matter when, when ratepayers in Andover realized what their water rates were going to do. I don't know why they couldn't have figured that out. I hope no one here is listening. Um, but they reconsidered and, and they eventually, after two special town meetings, agreed to a 99-year, I guess, intermunicipal agreement. North Reading, to allow for flexibility, filed a home, a home rule petition, I believe, two months ago. And they said, we would like to sign a 99-year intermunicipal agreement with either this community or Reading. So they don't know. Um, what I have impressed upon North Reading is if you wish to come to Reading's town meeting and ask anything of it, you will come with a very complete story, period. Um, honestly, I don't think they're used to doing business quite that way in North Reading. Um, they have spent over a million dollars to join the MWA, and now they may change their mind. That's certainly their business. Um, when some of us were at a couple of their town meetings, they, were, they authorized uh, the town to buy a house in order to put a pumping station in. Not a single person in the room asked, where's the house? In here, we would have had a, a fight <laughs> if we even tried something like that. So it's just a different community with different expectations. So right now, I would say the deal is off until North Reading tells us otherwise. If a deal is back on, we will incur marginal costs, and that's what this wheeling charge is meant to absorb. So. If, I'll just make up a number. If we figure out we have $100,000 a year of extra cost for water because they're decaying our system faster, we will assess a wheeling charge as we're allowed to do under the law of $100,000. So the real loss here is staff time. There shouldn't be any impact on the rate payers. Mr. Mon. Quick follow-up if I could. If isn't it possible to have a, a financial and reliability advantage to Reading if we wheel water to North Reading? Not just recover the increased cost to our system, but actually have a, uh, an increase to our, to our enterprise fund as, as part of the wheeling costs. Mr. Lasher. Um, I would say generally no. There are definite advantages of North Reading going down that route for us to have a backup water supply from the north. We only have one now from the south, so there are definite advantages. There's some hyd hydraulic or what is it? The, the models that they run suggest our system would run better with balance from the north. Um, but we're really not allowed to charge anything that's not accountable for in some way just to turn a profit. Now surely, some of the costs they would pay would be a share of expenses we might otherwise routinely have. Um, if we put in a larger water main in order to accommodate North Reading, we can then charge some fraction of the maintenance of that. So in a sense, yes, it's a shared cost, but it's not sort of just deriving a profit, if you will. I hope that answers. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge. Mr. Herrick. Uh, thank you. Uh, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Bob, in past years, uh, we've frequently, uh, at the end of the year, we've had to make some budget adjustments because we were, we conserved too much water, and we actually had to kick in some extra money to make MW MWRA whole. Perhaps it's included somewhere, and I haven't seen it, but what are the assumptions, and is that accounted for anywhere in this budget view? Mr. Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ex excuse me while I look, and I'll, I'll also talk, which is dangerous. Um, this is the first year in quite some time where we saw more water sold. 
and the, the volume of water sold determines water and sewer rates in large measure. Um, there is a discussion in the enterprise fund section about that. I don't know how complete it is, but we were able to up for the first time up our assumptions of volume sold. Our population's growing. It finally it finally hit the enterprise funds. So to go from 24 and a half thousand to 26 and a half thousand people has had an impact. While conservation is still very strong, the amount of people and the amount of water used has gone up. So you're, you're correct, we have not needed to make an adjustment this year, and actually the adjustment for next year is one of the main reasons why a 0% rate is achievable. Um, the increase in water sold, which flows to the amount of sewer, if you will, um, is worth between 35 and 4% on the rates. So we're always supposed to conserve water, but it's nice to be able to sell more water. And, and I would hope that this is also something the RMLD will see with the increased population, they'll eventually be selling more electricity. Further discussion? Not appearing. Who's your another one? No. Nope. Not appearing. We are ready for a vote on the entire budget. All those in favor of the budget as proposed, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. And just for clarification, let me make sure that the body understands the motions that were passed out Monday are word for word accurate, and that includes not just the totals of spending, but also the sources of funding, which is important to the town accountant. All right, that brings us back. Let's see. Mr. Berman moves that we take the substance of Article 10 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And. Uh, Article 10 is before the body. Ms. Angstrom. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to update or amend the bylaw related to the library replacement materials revolving fund. <laughs> Currently, this fund is used um, to replace materials that have been lost or damaged by um, patrons of the library. And the trustees are looking to expand its use. They want to use it for just for, for fees and for replacement of library materials. So the fees that they're looking to flow through this account are fees for printing, faxing, copying, um, and then they'd use those funds to buy paper, toner, whatever they need to provide that service. So the bylaw that you see on the slide is the general bylaw as it stands. Anything in bold is being added. Anything stricken is being deleted. Income report, Mr. McNeese. Income report? No. Mr. Leidinger. Thank you. Um, on, at the FinCom Museum meeting on April 11th, the uh, committee voted unanimously to recommend this item. Further, further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sylvester. At their meeting of March 12th, the bylaw committee voted 400 to recommend this article to town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Let's see. Mr. Merman moves that we take Article 13 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, Article 13 has been taken from the table. Uh, Mr. Doherty. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moradiator. This um, article allows the, the school committee, the school department, um, currently under Massachusetts General Law 30B, uh, we are only allowed to enter into three-year uh, contracts for, for different um, things like um, 
curriculum or things like that. But with the, with the new trend in digital curriculum, uh, what we are finding out is that with digital curriculum, we're allowed to get cheaper rates if we have a lease for or a purchasing of, a, of curriculum for longer than three years. So what this article allows us to do is allows us to purchase uh, curriculum uh, more for a six-year period um, instead of a three-year period, which, which allows us to uh, buy curriculum at a cheaper rate, and which saves us money long run in the school department budget. FinCom report, Ms. Johnson. Ann Landry, uh, at our fin FinCom meeting on March 7th, 2018, the Finance Committee voted 7-0-0 in favor of this article. Is there further discussion? Yes. Hi, Rebecca Bailey, Precinct 1. Uh, just a question. I don't understand if the state law says it can only be three years, how we can decide that it can be longer than that. Can you just explain? Town meeting uh, can give the authority of doing it longer than three years. Like override state law? Okay. Okay, thanks. Further discussion? Not appearing. All those in <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me. You wrote this. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that you just get to override state law here. But <laughs> <laughs> so, what the state law says is that if you want to enter into a contract longer than three years, you have to get town meeting approval. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Sylvester. Paul Sylvester, Precinct Three. Uh, can you give us some idea of what kind of savings we're talking about? How much? Yeah, I, I honestly don't know because right now we have not looked into the curriculum that we're going to be purchasing for next year. We're going to be looking into science curriculum uh, at the high school level. So we're, we are talking thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars, but it is thousands of dollars. And could you give us a better explanation of what you're calling digital curriculum? So digital curriculum um, is not textbooks, or the traditional textbook. What it is, is it's more of an interactive online curriculum. The advantages of having a digital curriculum versus a textbook is that digital curriculum is updated on a regular basis. So with a textbook, um, with a lot of advances that go on, for example, in science, uh, Pluto is a planet. Now it's not a planet, and then it is a planet again. With digital curriculum, it's updated on a regular basis. That's an example. Thank you. <laughs> Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Berman moves that we take the uh, substance of Article 15 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Um, Mr. Duresso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Tony Duresso, associate member of CPDC. I'm a little confused. Do I start with the CPDC report or do I start with a description of the article. Uh, you might as well give the report first. All right. Thank you. On Monday, January 22nd, 2018, the CBDC convened to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 15. All documents were made available on the town website. The public hearing was held to provide an opportunity for comment and to determine whether the provisions of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment should be included in the warrant for potential adoption by the town. The January 22nd, 2018 public hearing was opened at approximately 7.30 p.m. Any comments received at the hearing were included as part of the record of the hearing. On February 12th, 2018, the hearing was closed. The CBDC voted 5-0-0 to recommend Article 15 to town meeting. Thank you. Welcome. Article 15 is basically an attempt to take the industrial zone and make some changes to allow for more development. Uh, it started when one of the local small businesses wanted to expand, was one, wasn't allowed to because of setbacks. 
So what we've done is we've taken a review of the uh, intensity regulations and made some minor modifications that we'll go over. Uh, they were basically for the hotel motel use, uh, buildings per lot, the setbacks, and the transitional areas. While we're also doing the review, we looked at uh, clarifying some of the sections and any clerical errors or clerical changes that should be made. Uh, this was all done in an attempt to both allow for more flexibility for development while still protecting the abutters. Uh, the clerical, which were the simple ones, we did renumbering. Uh, we changed a little bit of the wording in gross area, the upland requirement, and some of the sections of 6.5.6.4, where we basically changed director of forestry division to tree warden. We no longer have a director of forestry division, I'm heard, I'm told. We do not. So we have a tree warden, which is why we had to change the text. Uh, the clarifications, we moved um, instead of multiple sections for everything from side setbacks to heights, we put that as part of the table to verify where uh, or to simplify where you would find all your information. Instead of having to read 400 pages, you just had to check one table. Uh, notes for footnote three, one, four, and eight. And as you see, most of the text remained the same. There were just minor modifications. But now it's all in one table. The major changes were for hotel motel use, where we've narrowed down the amount of the uh, lot size, which had a minimum before, of 25 acres. Uh, we've also minimized some of the setbacks, uh, 20 feet from the front, and 50 instead of 75 for the side and rear. Uh, we also made a change to how a shadow calculation will be determined. Um, I will be looking for a friendly amendment later on to add the words uh, stamped and sealed so that there is a valid um, study that can be referred to to make sure that nothing will cast a shadow on any of the residences. Uh, the buildings per lot, we've set it up so that you can have more than one principal building on an industrial lot. Uh, the used to be that if there were two buildings, they had to be 50 feet apart. We've allowed for a bit of flexibility there so that uh, based on what the building inspector and the fire chief say, you might be able to put your buildings closer than 50 feet. Uh, setbacks and lot coverage, this is the biggest change. Basically, we went from uh, 50 feet to 20. Is that right? Sorry for me to see. Um, sorry, yes, from 50 feet to 20 for the front yard and from 30 feet to 20 for the side and rear. Uh, one is for the principal use, the other is for exempt uses, school and church. And as you see, we went on lot coverage for motels and hotels from 60% to 25, uh, 25 to 60%, sorry. So they can cover more of their lot. Added a footnote for the setbacks uh, so that if a lot in the industrial district abuts another industrial lot, it can have actually build out to the lot line. This protects the residents but also allows more flexibility for your businesses. Uh, just a reminder, we're looking at these two small areas. You're looking at um, where the red arrows are, which is the industrial way off of Walker's Brook, and on the opposite side of Route 128 near Stoneham. All of the property here is owned by Mass DOT, so that probably will not have any impact. And here you have, and I'm looking for, you're going to look for your, um, it's going to be Bolton Street, Lakeview Ave, and Ash Street are basically the streets impacted by the transitional areas. So we've made a small change here that basically you have to have a lot line with the residential area, not within 150 feet. It gives a little more flexibility, but still should provide enough 
protection for the residences. And I'm going to skip over that. One of the other things we've added is a setback or step back on the buildings so that you, if you do have a residence next to an industrial, you don't have a massive building right next to you. And the final proposed change is landscaping. It had been specifically specified of a fence and what type of landscaping would be required. We've got more um, options and a little more flexibility. A reminder, everything still has to go through CPDC with a site plan review. So yes, you can allow for different types of landscaping to separate your residential and your industrial, but it's still going to get reviewed. I think that's it. If there are any questions? Is there further discussion? Yes, right in front. Yes. Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. Um, I, I didn't see the tree warden piece in here. But anyway, my question is, do we truly have a tree warden? What's the difference between a tree warden and an arborist? And I don't know, maybe, does this only pertain, this, this pertains town-wide, not just to industrial zoning or something. So can somebody just clarify that for me? Hi, Elaine, thank you. Um, Julie Mercier, Community Development Director. So my understanding is that we have a tree warden position, but the position is not currently filled. Um, I'm hoping someone else can answer the question about the difference between tree warden and an arborist. There you go. Jeff Sager, Public Works Director. We do have a tree warden uh, at the current time. At, at currently, uh, the difference between the certified arborist, you don't have to be a certified arborist to be a tree warden. It's just an additional certification. The certified arborist is, you know, there's a process to go through to become a certified arborist. But the actual tree warden is a position by state law. We have to have. Um, we have. A, we had, as you know, we had a vacancy in that position. But currently, there is uh, an individual acting as tree warden for the town. Are there things that, because the person is not an arborist, we can't do? And I guess I'm, I'm only slightly familiar with what the tree warden does, and I, I knew the previous one. Um, but at any rate, is there, are we at a disadvantage because it's not an arborist, and is, is that a cost issue? No, it really is. The tree warden, again, is a state requirement. Every community has to have one. Um, again, the certified arborist is an additional certification that is kind of above and beyond the tree warden, but we are covered with the tree warden position that we have. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Ms. Hillary? Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. What, if any, concerns were raised at the public hearing that you mentioned in your... Mr. Drezzo? I don't recall them exactly. I do know that I personally raised many concerns about the transitional areas. Uh, having a house that is right across the street from the industrial zone. Uh, we did look to make sure that Ash Street and Bolton were covered. Uh, part of Ash Street is actually safe. I will use that phrase because if you recall it's actually 60 feet up in the air. It's on a hill. So the industrial zone next to Ash Street or the higher portion of Ash Street is actually lower ground. It's not until you get to the bottom where the RMLD is that there's actually residences that are on the same level as the industrial. Okay. Um, my second question is regarding some of the more substantive changes. What if any um, guidance was used in making those substantive changes? So for example, did you look at other communities similar um, bylaws? Uh, or were you, or what, what industry standards did you use? I'm just curious. As I recall, we did not look at other bylaws. What we were looking to do was to increase the amount of potential development in the industrial area. Uh, the best way that we could determine to do that was to decrease some of the setbacks and the lot coverage requirements such that you could actually build out to a lot line or have multiple buildings. And my final question, as I was reading the background, I, and as you mentioned, this was brought about because um, a particular business had trouble adding on. And further, you want to make industrial growth 
easier is part of this related to the plans that Selectman Berman talked about relating to our general business growth to make it easier for those projects to happen? Yes, to an extent. Remember, this is only affecting the industrial area. That's what we limited this discussion to. We didn't work on business A or business B. Okay. Uh, so that we can't really, we, we are not making it easier for them at this time. We just looked at the industrial district and what we could do in that area. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right down the edge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brad Van Magnus, Precinct 6. Uh, just a few questions. Clarifying question on the height permitted for a hotel motel. Didn't know we had very many projects for those, but uh, so in 623.1, uh, it says 84 feet is the maximum. Uh, we then go to the chart. It says 55 feet or 60 feet, depending on whether or not you're in a business C or an industrial district. But yet in uh, note five of the same chart, we could have up to 95 feet. And if it's not habitable, it's unlimited. What is the height that we're going to allow? I'm going to ask for a moment just to review. I'll do my best to answer this for you. Um, so as you noted in section 6.2.3.1, it says it allows up to 84 feet if certain conditions are met. If you look in the table, um, it's, there are different heights depending on different districts. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the industrial district. We allow 60 feet, and then there's an, a footnote, which is footnote seven, which is the exception that goes back to 6.2.3.1. OK. All right. And then uh, the, the only other question that I have is in 6.2. I guess it's now 6.2, uh, which is where two or more principal buildings are permitted on the same lot. Uh, the uh, section B says the area between the buildings shall be maintained and kept clear by the property owner. How do we intend to enforce that? Over what period of time is that enforced? Is it simply during the, the project construction? How are we going to handle that going forward? That seems like an administrative nightmare for this town to continue to enforce. So that's a very good question. Um, as Tony noted in his presentation, any of these developments that are proposed will have to go through site plan review with the Community Planning and Development Commission. and when something goes through site plan review, if it gets approved, there's a decision that goes along with it that includes spe specifics just like this that give the town leverage to take zoning enforcement. Um, so either you know, the neighbors will let us know that things are not being kept clean or we'll notice it when we're doing you know, site visits um, and we will take the proper enforcement, which is what we do with you know, every site, commercial, industrial, large residential projects in town currently. Further discussion? Over here first. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, with the 85 uh, foot height restrict or exception, uh, is our fire department equipped to handle um, such heights right now? I will defer to the fire department if our chief. Chief Burns. It's difficult to answer a hypothetical. It would be a, considered a high-rise building. High-rise buildings have a lot of safety systems in it, built into it, such as pressurized stairwells and things like that. Uh, for instance, the Jordan's uh, building is a high-rise because of the IMAX theater that has a number of safety systems because of it. So it would depend upon the design. Um, our ladder truck has a height of 106 feet, uh, but it's depending upon how close you can get that to the building, how high you can get up to it. So 
it, it depends on the building, it depends on the occupancy and the safety system. So it's something we will look at very closely to make sure that we have the systems that we can operate uh, with inside. It would have to be fully sprinkled as well. Yeah, of course. Stamp right. pipes in the, in the stairwells and things. Yeah, I'm familiar. Huh. Just, uh, just, and then uh, my main question, uh, regarding the shadow line, um, as determined by the CPDC based on shadow studies submitted by the applicant, um, what, what's the definition of unacceptable? Because that's sort of just your definition of unacceptable. It sort of puts all the control in your hands on whether a project can go forward based on a shadow study. Acceptable. And I, I get the reason for the shadow study, and I like yes. it. But an unacceptable one would be any shadow on a residential building. Any shadow at all. That's why the study is there to show that it would not cast the shadow okay. on the residential building. Okay, at all. There's no time constraints or, you know, time No time year. constraints. It's at all. Correct. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. I look at this bylaw, <clears throat> if you ever want to keep a hotel out, you, you know, you require 25 acres. <laughs> this original zoning is anti-industrial, and I can see you want to bring it updated. It's a little late. We don't have much land here. Uh, what, what's uh, brought this impetus on all of a sudden? Is there, is there any interest from any entity, commercial interest, coming, wanting to come into town? As far as I know, there is no commercial interest that's trying to come in and build a motel hotel. Uh, nobody has, in, during any of the CPDC meetings, nobody has mentioned that anybody was. Uh, I would re refer back to town staff if they know of anybody, but as far as I'm aware, no, nobody. But remember, uh, oh, uh, we do have the DPW garage that is going to be worked on, and this could be a possibility, is my understanding. All right, all right. Um, okay. It's, it's, We've done zoning bylaw changes uh, many, many over the last 10 years, and this one here just like it's lagged and it's been anti-industrial. So I don't know what the reason is right now to bring this to the forefront. Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, new town meeting members should note that many, many years ago, Reading is the only community that has a hotel tax without a hotel. <laughs> so we're ready. Um, surprisingly, um, I was with the former economic development director on some of the trips, but not all. There are a number of significant developers in our area that know Reading pretty well that had no idea there was that industrial zone. They had just driven past it. They saw Market Basket. They had no idea. So yes, there actually is interest um, with some moderate to large developers if they could get their hands on a large piece, which is much more than the DPW lot by itself. Um, will this change help? Every, every change will help, I think. Um, you know, our former economic development director put Reading on the map. It's now up to us to figure out what the market is. Mr. Mon, did you have a question? Okay. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I also have a concern about the section and the shadow. It mm -hmm. seems that it has gone from something very specific to something that seems subjective and somewhat ambiguous. And I was confused about what an unacceptable shadow would be. Um, so if you're saying that any shadow would be unacceptable. I would say on a residence. If it hits a yard, it may be acceptable. But I would say anything that hits a house would be unacceptable. Well, this is building. Yes. So containing a dwelling, so that would be a house. A right. building, okay. So in that case, if you're saying that anything that would be an unacceptable shadow would be any shadow, can we just change the language from unacceptable to any? It's possible. Would you like to make that amendment? I would like to make that amendment. Okay, is there a second to that amendment? Okay, we are now discussing the proposed amendment. Okay, so I guess um, 
I guess if it becomes, um, you know, if, it, if we take away all, if we take away any specifics, so I guess I would have said to go from something very specific between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to something, you know, it, it maybe 10 percent or 20 percent or something, measuring a different way, but it seems to be going to something very subjective. Um, and, and I guess I'm just concerned about the protection of the residents with that when it becomes by right or it becomes um, that subject, subjective. So if that's what you're saying that it is, then I would want to put that in there. Before we move on, can you tell me exactly where it is? Um, six, six, two, three, four, one is the um, is that the new, that's the new number, six, two, three. Point two point three point one. Yeah, exactly. So in that section in A, it says an unacceptable shadow. That's in that's new language. An unacceptable shadow. Can we get that up on the screen? So you want to change that word to any? What was your proposed amendment? Well, my, well I, I, I was thinking that that was subjective and that there would be discussion right. over it, what so, would be. So what is so, your exact change? Is so, it yes, I am making, if he's saying that it means any, then I would change, then let's just call it any. Right there. Yep. In A. Friendly amendment um, to add signed and stamped to the studies. Did you yeah. present that as part of the motion? Then there's no need of. That's not an amendment. It's part of the, the the motion. He made the motion to put that sign stamped in there. That was you. You had it. It was written in the document, right? Oh, I yep. see. Okay. Okay. Can we put that up as well? Can you put that change up? Oh, we did. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't miss it. Okay, good enough. All right, we are now discussing the proposed amendment. Is there further discussion? Um, if I can respond, John Weston, CBDC. Um, uh, the purpose why this came up to begin with was really was was really to provide that flexibility because oftentimes with um, with these types of studies, you know. Um, Let's say a shadow casts, a, a, a building casts a shadow on the corner of a house for two days um, during the year, you know, during the, during the winter. Is that acceptable? If, if it doesn't hit a window, if it's, if it's just the, the back corner of the house, probably acceptable. And that's the kind of flexibility that we wanted to build in here. What, what we saw, um, in the way that it was worded before was that it was at, was I'm going to say too absolute um, oftentimes in zoning we see this a lot with our sign bylaws where we um, where we are absolute and have to be absolute but then uh, I'm going to say the the um, you know some things that I think everyone in this this um, room would agree is reasonable in keeping with our our um, commercial districts um, folks aren't allowed to do because we were too absolute. And this is one of those things where we, where we wanted to provide enough um, uh, flexibility so that we could, we could approve um, shadows that only happen you know, once or twice or three days a year, maybe, maybe a week, maybe a month. It, it, we'd have to see it to really understand it. But if this body wants it to be absolute, we can make it absolute. Well, I, I, I guess I don't have a problem with what you're saying. It's just that it becomes extremely subjective, and, it, and I want it, it to does. somehow protect you, you, a resident. Right. And I don't, I, I'm not quite sure how to do that. So, yeah. so 
Um, this would all be worked out during the public hearing process for the site plan review with the Community Planning and Development Commission and all of the abutters who have been notified of the hearing. Um, so it would just it would be a conversation that would be had, negotiation, a discussion. Um, anyone who was impacted would be informed. Um, but the idea was to give the CPDC discretion and to allow some flexibility. Ms. Delios. Thank you, Jean Delios, Assistant Town Manager. I just want to re-emphasize what Julie Mercier just said. The CPDC, as um, some of you in the room may know, spends a lot of time going through plans, going through the detail of each individual project. That's the beauty of site plan review. It's not a special permit. It's not a, a very formalized thing that claws back to statutory requirements that the state puts out. It's an invention of local government, site plan review. Site plan review lets us say, we're not going to write all the rules A to Z. We're going to have some general rules, and then we're going to have discussion, and we're going to take projects on their merit. And so that's an important distinction that, for some of you that haven't spent the countless hours that we've all spent here um, deliberating and reviewing and um, trying to work with developers, as um, Barry Berman said earlier, we think we're trying to turn a corner here in the community to promote economic development. We're spending lots of resources on economic development, so we want to make the rules protect the community in the way that we think the community wants to be protected, where these conflicts now are vetted. But we also really want to make it easier for developers. Somebody said, why don't we have a hotel? With those crazy rules, you're not going to get a hotel. So let's make it easy and simple, and let's move on. Do you, are you, you all set? Okay, further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, right in the middle. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, it's, when I first read this, it was the language that concerned me, and I think uh, she had similar concerns. Um, the way it's written, it, it, it doesn't say anything about being subject to site plan review. It's strictly subject to the CPDC. So that gives them the power, if they really don't like a project per se, just to kick it down, you know, you don't meet the shadow study on the zoning, you're going to have to reduce your size or whatever. Um, maybe if the language could change that um, it could be deemed unacceptable by the CPDC but subject to site plan review or, or something to those lines, I think would satisfy the protection of the resident, uh, the, home, the affected homeowner on the shadow study, and, um, but not give absolute control over that. Um, just to the CPDC, if that makes any sense. Well, understand, everything goes absolutely. through site plan review. Excuse me? Everything is going through site plan review. Correct. But the way this is written, mm -hmm. it says, no hotel or motel building may cast an unacceptable shadow as determined by the CPDC. So if you determine unacceptable, to me that sounds like, you know, it's a no-go for that design. Does that make sense? Ms. Yeah, Mercer, what you're saying makes sense. Um, so essentially, they decide that during the site plan review process and usually try to work with applicants and developers who, and proponents of projects to find something that does work that will fit into the neighborhood. Um, so it's not, it's the site plan review that gives them oversight of this and the ability to have this conversation. Okay, so it gives us the flexibility, but the real people that it affects still have a say in this, is my concern. Absolutely. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, Marlena Bita, Precinct 3. On that slide, Section B, the setbacks and buffers have been reduced, I think, a lot. and. I know we live inside of Route 128, where all the Are you houses. Discussing the proposed amendment. This, this, this section B. Sorry. The proposed amendment before us is to change the word uh, "unacceptable" to "any." That's what we're discussing right now. The, oh, I'm sorry. You're still on A. Okay. Okay. Then we'll I'll, come back to you then when, yep. we, when we when sure. we dispense yep. with that. Ms. Webb. Ryan Webb, 
uh, Precinct 1. I'm still just a little confused because the words in red are, they were really the original statement. When It's different from what was in the paper, but when you presented it, you said it would be may cast an unacceptable shadow as determined by the CBDC based on the stamped and sealed shadow. Is that correct? Yes. The okay. stamped and sealed is a friendly amendment. We had a discussion at CPDC. The goal was to make sure oh. that whatever study was provided was accurate. I, I understand. I'm excuse just trying me, to get... What's the problem here is there really isn't such a thing as a friendly amendment. You, oh. you made the motion including that stamped and sealed. At least that's the way I, I know, had determined okay. it. It's not printed. Where is it? Okay. So that is the way it, the stamped and sealed is part of the motion that you made. Okay, sorry. It's in, there are, must be three different things here. So it is in part, thank you. I just wanted it in black, bold, yes. So yeah. You all set? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nick Boyvin, uh, Precinct 7. I, I, I'm against this amendment. I, any, the, the way it reads right now, it actually broadens the um, original language. So before any of these changes were made, it was during specific months of the year, there could be no shadow. Now, apparently, since that language is taken out with the amendment, if there's any shadow, even in January or December, Christmas time, Thanksgiving, there's a shadow, that seems to be a function of the laws of physics to me, not what the CPDC thinks or doesn't think. So to me, this doesn't make sense. I think the CPDC are, are I believe, appointed uh, by the select board and for their expertise in this area. And that that's, you know, the select board is publicly accountable and there's certainly public comment at their meetings. So there is a link back to all of us as towns members uh, here for accountability. So to me, the, the word unacceptable is acceptable um, because the CPDC are you know, selected experts by a publicly accountable board. So I'm against this. I, I don't see how the CPDC can change when nature casts a shadow or doesn't. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, on the far end. Um, I, I, I agree. Can you state your name? And uh, sorry, Dimitri Sacris, Precinct 4. I agree with what was just said. However, I'm also aware that because a lot of the setbacks are changed, the possible unacceptable shadow that a homeowner um, might suffer from under a new hotel or motel building, we might be at more risk of that. So while I agree that the laws of physics are in play, I'm still concerned, especially when you said um, that a shadow can be cast on a yard but not on a building. That's actually, if you're in a house with a relatively small yard, that could actually have a tremendous negative impact on your property and your use of it. So I'm not sure what to do with that in terms of this amendment. But I want to make sure that the homeowners are protected in, I want to make sure that the hotel or motel developer, while getting a little more ease, mm -hmm. still needs to ask permission instead of, you know, saying he's sorry or she's sorry. Does that make sense? I don't think this accompl accomplishes that, does it? I believe you are correct in that it will not cover it on the yard because the bylaw specifically states on a building used for residents. Then I want it Any to say... Any building containing a dwelling unit in existence at the time. So it does say building unit. So that is where the shadow would have to fall. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Not appearing. Where are we? Oh, right here. I'm sorry. Mr. Herrick? Yeah, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, I understand uh, the desire to make it more precise, but I think that the any shadow doesn't really make any sense. At dawn, the shadow on a 60-foot tall building could go for a mile and literally cast 
any pl any house in that end of town could be hit by a shadow. So if if you were to hold it to that standard, you'd sort of it would be a no go. So I don't agree with the amendment. I do think that the idea of we say on any building, um, I would propose for um, uh, the previous speaker's recommendation. How is there a way of limiting that? And perhaps some language could be ins inserted you know, within, I don't know, maybe 20 feet or within 10 feet of a building, bring it back to unacceptable, put it close to a building. So if you're living on a yard and your entire yard is in the shadow of this building, even though it never hits your house, I could see that as being a problem as a homeowner. So perhaps an amendment that says within 20 feet of a, um, a building containing a dwelling, but go back to the unacceptable because there needs to be some flexibility on the part of a CPDC to, uh, um, determine uh, what really constitutes a problem. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, Michael Giacalone, Precinct 5. Um, when I read this and looking at it, uh, it says as determined by the CPTC, what recourse does someone who's receiving the shadow have if they don't agree with you? If the CPTC comes out and says, well, this is acceptable but you're not the one with the shadow, what does that person affected by? What kind of recourse do they have to try to combat that and say, no, this is not acceptable to us. We're the ones with the shadow. Ms. Delios? Again, I want to go back to the um, site plan review process. So there is a public notification process. It's a public hearing for site plan review. And the abutters are notified. We go out 300 feet. So that's probably not something everyone in this room is intimately aware of, but there's a lot of discussion at these public hearings, at the site plan review meetings, um, and the abutters come, and they provide feedback, and we work that into the process. So that's not reflected in the document in this language here, but that's in reality what the way we go about this. And does CPTC still have the ability to say, well, we hear you, but we still think it's acceptable? That's entirely up to the board. Like any board, when there's an applicant before them, um, it, it, it's, there, isn't, there isn't one recipe that I can pull up of how it goes. I can tell you, when members of the public come to CPDC, I've been going to the meetings for nine years, the, the board listens very closely and tries to come up with ways to work it out. Hmm. Mr. Meares, do you have a comment? Or? Yep. I think the question you have is whether, if the CPDC gets it wrong, what's your recourse? And the answer to that is in section four, six, 10, you have appealed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Further discussion? Yes, right in the middle. Mr. Greenfield. David, David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Um, I've been at uh, the meeting where a resident wanted something. CPDC thought otherwise and flat out the resident did not get what they wanted. That happens. That's, if it's written in a way that it's the CBCD's decision over the objections of the resident, CPDC decides. And if it's within the bylaw, appealing doesn't get you anywhere. So I, I'm for this uh, to give the resident more leverage. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Uh, yes. Mr. Simmons? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Uh, this whole thing is talking about hotels, motels. Is there any, how about the rest of the buildings in an industrial zone? Is this only it being, what about stores, office buildings? Is that part of the industrial zone? Why isn't that addressed? 
It is in part of the industrial zone. The issue here is that hotels and motels have a special exemption for additional height. So in that additional height, we want to make sure that they're not casting any additional shadows on residences. So other buildings are covered uh, elsewhere? Yeah. So, Ms. Mercer. Um, what I will say is that in the bylaw, while it might not specifically state that a shadow study is required, oftentimes if buildings are a certain height or they're pretty close to residential neighborhoods, we do ask the applicants for them and they are reviewed by the CPDC. So it does become part of the process. Thank you. Further discussion on the, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jared Bullier, Precinct 2. Uh, Clearly, there's some discrepancy over the exact wording of this, and as much as people would like to uh, always agree with the CPDC or with each other, we're obviously not always going to be on that case. Uh, that being said, I would like to make a motion for a five-minute unmoderated caucus to discuss further changing of the words of this amendment. That would be out of order. To discuss yeah, an amendment we, to the we amendment? We are going by the, the rules here. You we're not going to have an unmoderated discussion. Further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We are now back to the uh, main motion. Yes. Thank you, Jared Bullier, Precinct 2. Would now be an appropriate time to make a uh, motion for an unmoderated caucus of five minutes to discuss. No, no, that, that, that's, it's the idea of that that I'm not uh, accepting. Yeah. Further discussion on the main motion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, Precinct 4. On Section uh, 6.2.6.2, Letter A. It looks like there's a stray T. There's a distance. Um, yeah. So, are you talking about the T at the very front that's bold? So it it goes with the H E in the middle of the. Day. Oh, clever. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, you actually are changing the word they. It's just a fr friendly amendment to delete that H-E and make T a word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there a second to that? Uh, okay. Further discussion on that? All right. We'll take a vote on that. All those in favor of that uh, proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Grant? May I keep the microphone? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to follow up on... Actually, you know what, on um, the, the previous item we were talking about with the shadow, it did occur to me that we're, we're saying a shadow on a dwelling unit. In your discussions, did you discuss whether or not a, a shadow might not be welcomed by neighboring businesses or other industrial users of the area? As I recall, that did not come up during our discussions about shadows on other businesses. But once again, uh, anybody within 300 feet will be notified during the site plan review. The shadow study will be presented. If a business has an issue with it, they can certainly bring it up at that point. Uh, I, I will not make any promises, and I cannot, but I would assume that the CPDC will listen to people who have a shadow, and that's why they're asking for the study. Okay, I'll yield the floor. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mon. Thank you, Jamie Mon, uh, Precinct 4. If I just understood that uh, previous discussion, if, if a hotel casts a shadow on an entire yard, but not on the building, According to this, CPDC could not deny that building. They don't have the discretion because this only addresses the building. So
So there is no restriction or no way CBDC can deny an application if the shadow covers the rest of the lot. Is that correct? Mr. DeRezzo. I will go with Mr. Myers, who says, yes, that is correct. However, I will point out that the CPDC covers more than just the shadow. The entire project needs to meet their requirements. And if a business owner or developer decides that the shadow is the most important part of his business and will refuse to make any changes because it doesn't meet zoning, my assumption is that there are other issues with that building that probably do not meet zoning that can be used as leverage. Further discussion? Okay, I would like to then propose an amendment um, on any building containing a dwelling or other use of the lot. based on a stamped and sealed shadow study submitted by the applicant, uh, an unacceptable shadow on any building containing a dwelling or other use of the lot. An unaccept so it's an unacceptable shadow on any other use of the lot. Use or area? Or use uh, area? Uh, area would, would work. Might I make a uh, friendly amendment? Sure. Instead, I would say a building containing a dwelling unit or its lot. That would be good. Thank you. Like building or lot containing a dwelling unit? Mr. Maybe? Meharis, did you have a comment? or a lot containing a dwelling unit. Yeah, that's that doesn't cover the other uses that he was mentioning, but it covers the, the yard concern. Yeah. So you want to add or other use of the lot? Is that? Okay. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yes. Okay, all right. Is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. We are now back to the main motion. Further discussion? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Andy Friedman, Precinct 4, member of the Select Board. Um, I have a feeling that you already answered this question because no one else has asked the question, but um, for Section 6.6, 6.22 and the old section, lot frontage for a single family uh, 20 district, and 6.2 used to be 6.23 yards about residential uh, residence districts. That was struck, and, and you probably explain why that was struck, but I, I must have missed it. So these are two examples of regulations um, that exist in the bylaw now that were moved to the table as footnotes um, so that users and staff can look in one place and find a majority of the regulations rather than having to look at many different pages which can easily result in errors. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Tsekris, Precinct 4. Um, I might need your advice on how best to do this. I would like to propose I'm looking at 6.5.5 in the green book on page 24. Um, in fact, forgive me, before that 6.4.1.4 on page 23, section B. Um, 
Recently, I was called an apparatchik, which I thought meant tree hugger, but it doesn't. But I am a tree hugger, so I have amendments that are about trees. Um, there in B, and then there are three others. I would like to add um, that 75% of the trees planted shall be native trees, native to this area. That, seems out of the, uh, that, that is out of the scope of the uh, article. I'm sorry, who's that? That, that is out of the scope. It would be, um, it's, it's not acceptable. It's out of the scope of the article. Any amendment has to be part of the, um, the article itself, and that is, that's beyond the scope of it. So that would be out oh, of the Oh, so, okay. So even though there's a call for the kind of trees, uh, evergreen or deciduous, it's beyond the scope to get native trees in? Correct. Okay. That's too bad. Um, So just check me. There are three more. 6.5.5. These are, um, you know, the kinds of trees that the tree warden will deem appropriate. Um, maybe, maybe I can help you here a little bit. Mr. Meares? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can help you here a little bit. The only motion, the only amendments that are proposed are the ones that are in bold. And so that's the only, those amendments are what's before the town meeting now. You can make adjustments to those amendments, but you, what you can't do is propose other amendments to other sections that are, that are not I before the town meeting I didn't understand that. Now. So I missed my chance because I didn't know about the public hearing. Is that essentially correct? Okay. Well, I'm, I can't say why you missed your chance. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in other words, that's why, that's where well, luckily, we have these meetings, you know, twice a year, so you, there, there'll be other opportunities to propose amendments. To these, um, to these if you, if bylaws? You, if, you would like, if you would like to propose an amendment to the, uh, uh, to the CPDC, perhaps they'll um, take you up on it. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Meharis. Uh, yes, um, Ms. Binder, then we'll come back over there. Angela Bend, Precinct 5. I have a question about where two or more principal buildings are permitted. Um, the minimum distance shall be determined at the discretion of the building inspector. Is 6.2.6.5 uh, page 19 in the green booklet? with the crossed out seven, six, two, seven, six, two. Um, my question is, is that something new for a building inspector to be doing, to be determining something like that? Is that a, is that a normal, a normal responsibility of a building inspector? Is that something that the CB, CB, CPDC generally handles? Ms. Mercer. Thanks, Angela. Um, what I would say is in a town like Reading, where we tend to have setbacks and building separations that are greater than 10 feet, um, it's not something that our building inspectors are commonly doing. Um, in cities, it's probably very common. Um, this has been run by the building inspector, and he didn't have any concerns with it. I don't know if that helps. Okay, so, so it is not in our town, but it might become I mean, a new responsibility. Building inspectors all go through the same trainings and the same certifications no matter where they're working in the state. Um, so I'm sure he's perfectly capable of doing it. It probably isn't very common in Reading, um, where buildings tend to be, you know, greater distances from each other than in urban areas. Okay, thank you. Ms. Schneider? No, you're all set. Okay. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, just at this point, just a question to simplify. Uh, go back to section 6231, which is um, the first part of that was the shadow. Um, but the second part um, is talking about reducing the setback, which, um, at least as I read it, is already in table 6.3 at 50 feet. 
um, for buildings up to uh, maximum height of 60. And so really I think where you're bringing this back to 50 feet, you're already, you're now you're consistent with that table. So really the only caveat in B is, um, so that if the, if, if the following conditions are satisfi satisfied, and so B actually could read as simple as a landscaped or natural vegetated buffer at least 20 feet wide shall be provided along the major street except where there are curb cuts. Because you're, the reduction to 50 feet is now consistent with the, with the table in 6.3. Um, yeah, so actually the reason that I originally proposed that change was to make it consistent with the table, so I'm glad that someone noticed that. Um, and you're right, it probably isn't needed to be stated twice. Um, but I would want to give it a little more thought before just completely deleting it so that there's no unintended consequences. Yeah, I, I'm always an advocate of not duplicating things in different places of the bylaw because that just gives you the opportunity to have them out of sync. I know this was intended to be an exception paragraph, so perhaps it doesn't have an impact. I, I, I'm okay if you want to leave it like that, but I just raise that point that it is, in fact, a, a potential duplication now that you've made the table, now that you've made the setback consistent. Um, uh, John Weston, CPDC. So um, it does say it needs to be set back 50 feet from a major street. So um, what is a major street? It's really, I don't think it's really defined, um, but in, um, uh, you know, they could start to play some tricks, right? Which they, you know, sometimes sometimes do in turning a hotel sideways so that the front, so that that's closer to um, to uh, a side street or the the, you know, so that we, we want to make sure that it it doesn't that they don't do something where they're sitting um, the the side uh, so that their side yard is on the. Uh, is what you and I would consider their front, and then um, and then be able to be only 20 feet back. Okay, so so you're, that's so you so this is actually then an additional requirement. So even if this the, to the, to your point, if they put it so that the my, if they say well, well that's a side street and this is a major street, we could be 20 feet off the main street because that's a side yard requirement right, in the right, table. Right. Right. So this then is actually keeping a minimum 50-foot setback on a major street, even if it is a side or even a rear yard. Even if it is their side the, yard, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. Do I have my counters from the other night? Mr. Brown, Mr. Crook, Mr. Rushworth, and Ms. Hillary. All those in favor of the uh, proposed the, the motion, please rise. Twenty-seven. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. Forty-two. I'm, excuse me? Forty-two. Forty-two. And those opposed, please rise. Zero. Zero. One. One. Zero. 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 The vote being 125 in the affirmative, one in the negative. The motion carries. Uh, business under Article 18. Are we up to 18? Make sure here. Yep. All right. This is a little tricky, especially for new people. Let me explain what happens here. We have four names on the motion that would be removed if we did not take their names off. So we're going to call on each precinct chair to, to see if they have discussed this. First of all, be precinct one is the... Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Sheila Mulroy, precinct one. 
um, we voted unanimously to strike Michelle Minnie's name from this list so that she remains as a town meeting member. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Now you understand what you're voting for. If you strike the name, it means the person gets to stay in town meeting. So all in favor of that motion to strike the name, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Precinct 2. Precinct 2, Chair here. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Moderator. Yes. Tony DiRezzo, Chair, Precinct 2. We voted unanimously to leave Mr. Kelly's name on the list. Okay. All right. Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Precinct 4 voted that Robert B. Connors remain on the list and thus be removed from town meeting. Okay. Precinct 6. Hi, Michelle Sanfi, Precinct 6. We voted, oh, I don't remember the number of the vote, but we did vote to strike Michael Allen Mandel from the list so he can remain a town meeting member. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. All right, we now have two names that are still on there. When we vote this, those two, if you vote in favor, those two would be removed. All those in favor of the uh, motion under Article 18, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. I think we have now exhausted the warrant. Mr. Berman, do you have a motion? No. <laughs> What's that? Oh, there's an instructional motion? Oh, no, there weren't any, no. Mr. Berman, do you have a motion to adjourn sine die? We have a motion to adjourn sine die. Is there a second? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This annual meeting stands adjourned. Sine die. <laughs>